be recorded. I will now hand it over to Toy Roberts to begin the meeting. Toy, go ahead. Hello, and welcome to the Federal Housing Finance Agency's Duty to Serve public listening sessions on the enterprise's proposed 2022 to 2024 underserved market plans. I am Toy Roberts, a member of the Duty to Serve team, and I will be emceeing today's session, and the session is being recorded. Today, we will hear comments on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's proposed new plans for the manufactured housing market. But before we get started, I'd like to first introduce you to the lead of our Duty to Serve team, the Managing Director of, the Duty, to, of Duty to Serve, Ms. Marcia Berenger. Thank you, Toy. I'm Marcia Berenger, and I'm the Supervisory Policy Analyst for the Duty to Serve program at FHFA. It is my pleasure today to introduce Acting Director Sandra Thompson, who knows the Duty to Serve program very well and who will be providing today's opening remarks. President Biden appointed Sandra Thompson to be Acting Director of the FHFA three weeks ago on June 23rd. Director Thompson has a distinguished career in public service and has been a champion of affordable housing issues for many years. As Deputy Director of Housing Mission and Goals here at FHFA, she oversaw affordable housing and mission activities, including the Duty to Serve program. Director Thompson. Thank you, Marcia. And let me thank all of our participants in this week's virtual listening sessions. All across the United States, Americans are struggling with the housing crisis. Each market and community faces its own mix of challenges, but a common theme can be found, and that is in widespread shortages of affordable housing. The total supply of housing is insufficient to meet ongoing demand, and new housing production is skewing towards higher price segments of the market. That leaves low and moderate income Americans increasingly cut off from housing opportunities. FHFA's mission through our regulated entities is to responsibly foster a sustainable housing finance system that supports equitable access to both affordable home ownership and rental housing, reaching communities of color, rural areas, and other underserved populations. And duty to serve plays an important part in this. Under the Safety and Soundness Act, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are each charged with the duty to provide leadership in facilitating a secondary market in mortgages for families in three specific underserved markets, affordable housing preservation, manufacturing housing, and rural markets. FHFA's implementing regulation requires each enterprise develop, to develop its own plan for serving specified markets over three-year timeframes. Earlier this year, the enterprises submitted their proposed 2022 to 2024 underserved market plans, which are posted on the FHFA website. This week, FHFA has held a listening session for each statutory underserved market to encourage feedback on those plans from stakeholders and the public. Interested parties are encouraged to submit written comments on the proposed plans through our website, fhfa.gov. FHFA and the enterprises want to hear your feedback on how best to reach underserved markets. During a time of shortages, preservation of the existing affordable housing stock becomes even more urgent. Recent estimates show that just in the next five years, a quarter of a million publicly subsidized homes will see their affordability requirements expire. It is critical that the enterprises meet their duty to serve in this market in keeping with their charter purpose to promote access to mortgage credit throughout the nation. Manufacturing housing is one option that has potential to grow the affordable housing supply without subsidies. And duty to serve has already produced demonstrable results in increasing enterprise support for manufactured housing. For example, 
The enterprises almost doubled their purchases and loans secured by manufactured housing titled as real property between 2017, the year before duty to serve was implemented, and 2020. In addition, both enterprises exceeded their loan purchase targets for manufactured housing communities with tenant pad lease protections, providing new and important protections for residents in these manufactured housing communities. And manufactured housing is an especially important resource for many rural communities. Rural areas tend to have limited housing options and older housing stock. Getting an accurate appraisal can also be difficult. Fortunately, despite the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 saw the enterprises still able to exceed some of their goals in the rural housing market. FHFA looks forward to them doing even more to connect rural areas to national housing finance. FHFA expects the enterprises to live up to their mission obligations and help ensure that investment capital reaches underserved markets. Danny and Freddie have a responsibility to identify the obstacles in these communities that these communities face in accessing mortgage credit and affordable housing, as well as a duty to develop strategies for overcoming them safely and soundly. As we enter the next three years of duty to serve, I look forward to seeing the enterprises fulfill their charter purposes by increasing the liquidity of mortgage investments and improving the distribution of investment capital throughout the country. Their success in this mission will play a critical role in reliving our nation's widespread affordable housing shortage. Thank you again for joining our listening session. I will now turn the program over to Troy. Thank you, Director Thompson. Now, before um, we move forward with the remainder of the agenda, I do have a few important housekeeping remarks. As you know, we have organized this webinar in order to obtain your input on the enterprise's proposed 2022 to 2024 underserved market plans for the manufactured housing market. During today's session, FHFA will not discuss the status or timing of any potential rulemaking if FHFA does decide to engage in a rulemaking on any matters discussed in today's session, this session would not take the place of a public comment process. The rulemaking document would establish the public comment process and you would need to submit your comments, if any, in accordance with the submission instructions in that document. FHFA may summarize the feedback gathered at today's session in a future rulemaking document if we determine that a summary would be useful to explain the basis of a rulemaking. Also, please keep in mind that nothing said in today's session should be construed as binding on or a final decision by the FHFA director or FHFA staff. Any questions we may have are focused on understanding your views and do not indicate a position of FHFA staff or the agency. Now, um, with that said, we do have a great lineup of speakers for today. We have, today we will hear from 20 guest speakers and midway through we will hear, we will have a short seven minute break. Each speaker will have up to seven minutes to speak and we will try our best to stay on schedule and ask that everyone speaking helps us do so as well. I would chime in to give speakers a one minute warning as their time draws to a close. If someone does go over their time, unfortunately, I will have to interrupt you in order to keep us on schedule. Each speaker will have the ability to mute and unmute their microphones throughout the session, but we ask that you keep your microphones muted and your cameras off until it is time for you to speak. We also ask that all speakers be prepared to turn on their video cameras during their speaking segment. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, we are recording today's session. FHFA will also prepare a transcript of today's session, which will include the names of all speakers 
and the organizations you represent. We will post the recording and transcript on FHFA's website and YouTube channel, along with any materials being presented today. Now, before we begin to hear from our guest speakers, each enterprise will give brief opening statements. And as we close, they will also give closing remarks. First up, we will hear from Fannie Mae and speaking from the Fannie Mae Duty to Serve team is Mr. Mike Hernandez. Toy, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Hernandez and I'm Fannie Mae's Vice President of Engagement and Impact. Uh, let me first thank uh, Acting Director Thompson and all her team for facilitating this uh, session today and the two previous sessions over this past week. They've been very, very impactful. Uh, it's my pleasure today to share with you a quick overview of our key accomplishments in the manufactured housing market, as well as ways that we're continuing to build on our work in, in the coming 2022 to 2024 duty to serve plan. Fannie Mae's purpose and mission is to ensure that there's liquidity in the single family and multifamily mortgage market everywhere across the country every day, while improving access to sustainable mortgage financing for those of modest means. And our duty to serve activities complement our core mission by challenging us to increase access to mortgage credit beyond our current investment levels. We have an excellent duty to serve team and most all of them are on this call today, but we can't do this challenging work without you and without your collaboration and your support. So thank you for working with us as we test and learn new opportunities and for the guidance you guys continue to give us. Together, we're making a difference in where it's needed most through our duty to serve plan. So let me highlight for you some of the key multifamily and single family plan accomplishments <clears throat> over this past few years. So if we can go, <clears throat> excuse me, to slide three. Thank you, Tony. Uh, in our multifamily business, Fannie Mae remains one of the largest financiers of manufactured housing communities in the country. And through these activities, we've financed 130 manufactured housing communities representing over well, nearly 16,000 MH units with tenant pad lease protections, a, per, a particularly important component to protect tenants. As a means to ensure affordability for manufactured housing communities, we engage nonprofit and government entities to finance our first four non-traditional MHC loans. In our single family business, we stretched our mortgage product development efforts to do a number of things. One, better facilitate MH Advantage financing. We changed our policy to allow MH single wide eligibility. We enhanced our MH construction to perm product and we added several other selling guide updates responding to what we heard from stakeholders in the MH industry. Throughout this period, we held frequent outreach and trainings with MH industry partners, including lenders and manufacturers, retailers, researchers, developers, appraisers, and others. And we even worked with a local MH association to assist their efforts to amend their town's land development code to allow for manufactured housing. And in the first three years of our duty to serve plan, we've seen a 58% increase in MH loan purchases as compared to the period prior to the plan. So if we can jump to slide five. So now looking forward, what's next in our next three years? We'll maintain our focus on financing manufactured homes as real property. Our efforts will result in at least 27,000 loans over the next three years and a 16% increase in 2024 in loan purchases over our baseline. We'll scope the opportunity to expand the financing of manufactured homes as real property in resident owned MHCs and possibly privately owned MHCs so that by 2024, we can launch a loan product that meets this need. And to expand the financing of newly constructed manufactured homes, by 2023, we'll develop loan products that streamline financing of manufactured and as real property located in fee simple subdivisions. Slide six, please. We'll in the multifamily space, we'll expand our efforts to increase purchases of loans 
secured by MHCs owned by government entities, nonprofits, and resident-owned communities. By 2024, we expect these efforts will result in nearly 2,000 additional units of these types financed. Recognizing that tenant site lease protections preserve affordability and stability of MHCs across the country and safeguard tenants from predatory practices, we're going to build our industry leading work to expand tenant site lease protections so that by 2024, 30% of all Fannie Mae MHC properties financed will include these protections. And this represents a 131% increase from our baseline. We're very proud of our achievements under the Fannie Mae Duty to Serve Plan. We look forward to ramping up our successful initiatives in 2022 and welcome your comments and suggestions on how we can continually improve our plans. All of us at Fannie Mae are committed to finding ways and new ways to partner with you to support our duty to serve markets and help families find that sustainable, safe, and affordable place to call home. Thank you for your time and your comments in advance to this afternoon and for participating in this very, very important session today. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Toy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Now we will hear uh, opening remarks from Freddie Mac, speaking from the Freddie Mac Duty to Serve team are Mr. Mike Dawson, Mr. Corey Aber, and Mr. Dennis Smith. Hey, thank you, Toy. And on behalf of Freddie Mac, welcome and thank you for taking the time here today. And especially thank you to FHFA for organizing this event. I'm Mike Dawson, Vice President of Client and Community Engagement within the single family organization here at Freddie Mac. And uh, it's great to see many of your uh, uh, videos up there. And uh, I look forward to all of the constructive comments we'll be hearing today. We value your support and partnerships over the last several years, and particularly your dedication to the manufactured housing industry itself and supporting communities across the country. And so again, looking forward to hearing from you today and the continued partnership and successes we can draw together in supporting manufactured housing this year and the years ahead of us. With that, I do wanna turn it over to Corey and Dennis to give you more details about our plan. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, and, and thanks everybody. I'm Corey Aber, I'm Senior Director of Mission Policy and Strategy for Freddie Mac Multifamily. Uh, Toy, if you could advance the slide uh, just a little bit. Uh, you know, when, we, when we think about uh, duty to serve, right, we're thinking about something that is fundamental to our business and, and fundamental to our mission, uh, our mission of, uh, of providing affordability, stability, and liquidity to the, to the market uh, and, and to all markets, right? So over the first duty to serve plan, we had a, a really strong focus on doing two things at once building a foundation in parts of the market where we weren't as present as uh, we wanted to be, uh, and also having a direct impact uh, wherever possible. And we saw that uh, in the manufactured housing space. Um, we look to expand you know, new, uh, new product offerings, new loan offerings, research and thought leadership and collaboration across this market. And we saw a lot of that in the first three years of our plan. We see a lot more of that this year, and we have more planned in our next cycle. Uh, if you could advance the slide uh, just once more. Uh, in our first plan, and, and I'll speak uh, for a moment about some multifamily activities and then turn it over to, to Dennis, who leads our single family manufactured housing uh, activities. Uh, in the multifamily space, we put out a lot of research trying to understand better and promote a greater understanding of the resident owned community market and also uh, tenant protections in manufactured housing communities. And you know, we, and through Duty to Serve, created a market for uh, MHCs with tenant protections above and beyond state law. We found in our research that none of these protections were available in all states. Uh, and thanks to our work and, and thanks to Fannie Mae's work and, and Duty to Serve, these are available now to communities that never had access to these before. Um, and you know, we're looking to uh, continue that work work this time around. We set a strong foundation, started purchasing loans immediately after putting our product offering out there. And we're looking to grow those loan purchases in the next plan cycle uh, over time. Dennis, I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Corey, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Multifamily has had some great success, but so have we in single family. We have helped more than 14,000 homeowners create a home with a manufactured home. And as Corey mentioned, duty to serve allows us to take manufactured home and really make it part of our DNA at Freddie Mac. Since we've implemented duty to serve, it gives us other opportunities to support and promote manufactured homes. Some of those created new mortgage products uh, where we have renovation offering, our choice renovation, which can be used on manufactured homes. Our energy and water efficiency product, our choice home is eligible for manufactured homes. And we made over 15 additional underwriting guideline changes to make doing business with manufactured homes easier. And a lot of those recommendations came from you. Not only did we focus on the production piece, but we also focused on outreach, educating realtors, lenders about manufactured housing and how it is a great affordable choice for home ownership and also preparing home buyers. We've helped educate over 3,800 home buyers on why manufactured housing is a great option when they are purchasing their home. In fact, if we look at the number of consumers that we helped in single family, 51% of those home buyers were first time home buyers. We could go on and, and talk about what we've done, but I think our uh, reading our reports uh, would definitely help. But really what I wanna say is we couldn't do it without you. It really helped open our eyes to what's needed in the market and how we could provide additional liquidity and stability uh, to the manufactured housing market. Uh, Toy, if you would go to the next slide, please. At the end of the day, we're listening. We want to hear the feedback that you have today on our plan that we put into the marketplace. Uh, we're looking at doing some interesting things, uh, and we're very interested to hear what you have to say. And again, those opportunities for us to come alongside you and use your current expertise to help us develop these products and programs. We look forward to hearing what you have today uh, and taking that into account and into action. So with that, I'll turn it back to Toy. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. All right, so now without further ado, we will begin hearing from our guest speakers. Um, and so we, our first uh, speaker is Ms. Esther Sullivan, Dr. Esther Sullivan from the University of Colorado, Denver. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to comment on the enterprise's proposed plans uh, for duty to serve. Um, I'm a sociologist at the University of Colorado, and I'm the author of the book, Manufactured Insecurity, Mobile Home Parks, and Americans' Tenuous Right to Place. And I spent the last 11 years documenting and analyzing the unique role that manufactured housing plays in the U.S. affordable housing stock and the unique housing insecurities that are related to manufactured housing and especially to manufactured home communities. Manufactured housing is less than half the cost of site-built housing to produce, which makes it an innovative and radically affordable housing option. Manufactured homes provide affordable rental housing, but they are especially important as a source of low-income home ownership. The Manufactured Housing Institute estimates that 70% of all homes sold under $125,000 are manufactured homes. So simply put, this is the primary route to the American dream for lower income home buyers. So first I applaud the GSE's efforts to increase loan purchases for manufactured homes titled as real property um, and to provide a secondary market um, in these loans as multiple stakeholders have, have identified this is a crucial step and I hope efforts in this area will expand. Two comments here. The bulk of real property loans are available for newer, larger, and double wide manufactured homes, and not as much for single wide and older homes. And this leaves out most of the manufactured home market. There is a real demand for smaller, lower cost, and pre owned homes. 
So um, I hope you'll continue to keep this in mind. And second, of course, is chattel. Most manufactured homes are classified as personal property, which limits the owners of these homes to personal or chattel financing. In many states, it's the default to title a manufactured home as personal property, and then there's extensive steps that are required to retitle the home as, as real property. So of course, we, we first need to support a secondary market for these chattel loans, and I know that there's, this, there's um, a pilot program to do so. But we also know that an estimated 65% of borrowers that own both the home and the land and would qualify for a, a, a real mortgage um, use chattel instead. So in addition to the pilot to support chattel loans, existing owners of manufactured homes would benefit from retitling their homes to real estate and then qualifying for mortgage refinancing. Uh, second, a broad comment, I'm, I'm especially excited by Fannie Mae's commitment to expand efforts made since 2018 to support the placement of manufactured housing in fee simple developments, which is just another way of saying conventional single family neighborhoods. As my own research and the research of others has identified, the exclusion of manufactured housing from conventional neighborhoods and the segregation of this housing stock is not only a major barrier to the production and expansion of manufactured housing, but it's also a key driver of inequalities facing manufactured home residents. These include inequalities in financing that we're talking about today, but also inequalities in housing security, in protections from natural hazards, and in wealth generation. So supporting the placement of manufactured housing in fee simple developments uh, or conventional single family neighborhoods is also really key. And finally, as in all areas of affordable housing, we need to focus on production and supporting financing for new manufactured homes, but also on preservation, holding on to the affordable housing that we already have. About half of all manufactured homes are located in manufactured home communities where residents face multiple forms of housing insecurity because they do not own the land where their homes are placed and in many cases do not have long term site protections for that land. Given what has been a veritable rush of institutional and private equity investment in the manufactured home community space. There must be special attention paid to expanding site protections for homeowners in these communities, including an opportunity to purchase provision. Investors currently have superior access to credit that's backed by the enterprises in the name of promoting affordability, you know, through the ownership of these manufactured home communities. But as just one example, Haven Park Capital, utilizing a Fannie Mae credit facility, uh, Bellwether Enterprises, funded their $100 million purchase of manufactured um, home communities in this way. And residents in Haven Park communities have banded together as they've seen their rents rise 50 and 60% and some have been displaced from the homes they own as a result. So if we want to promote long-term affordability and stability, the GSE's loans to acquire manufactured home communities should be primarily available to residents looking to purchase their communities and to nonprofits that agree to preserve their communities and, their, and to preserve affordability. If these loans continue to be available to investors, the GSE's should really focus on these resident protections, on long-term leases, provisions to maintain affordability, and on an opportunity to purchase provision. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Our next speaker um, is Mr. Grant Beck from Next Step Network. Well, good afternoon, and thank you to FHFA for the opportunity to provide comments on the enterprise's duty to serve proposed underserved markets plans for 2022 through 2024 as they relate to manufactured housing. Uh, we also thank the enterprises for their ongoing work to support the housing needs of all Americans under duty to serve. Next Step Network is a national nonprofit housing intermediary that works to promote expanded use of factory built housing as a viable solution to address housing affordability. Our organization works with partners across the country to provide a pathway to sustainable home ownership for low and moderate income families through housing counseling services, financial home and home buyer education, and leveraging new Energy Star manufacturing. 
For generations, the blueprint of wealth creation and equity building in this country have been predicated on the financial gains of affording a home. Yet millions of households, particularly those individuals living in lower income communities of color, on tribal lands, and in immigrant communities, have been barred from this quintessentially American path to prosperity by a lack of affordable housing choice. Our organization and partners remain firmly rooted in the belief that manufactured housing is a primary solution to address both the supply and affordability gaps. Continued and expanded participation by both enterprises in the manufactured housing space can help bring scalable solutions to better address the housing needs of all Americans. Unfortunately, the proposed plans for 2022 through 2024 are woefully inadequate representing a retrenchment from the incremental progress of the first plan cycle as the affordable housing crisis and racial wealth gaps worsen. However, the enterprises cannot be expected to offer ambitious plans uh, specific to duty to serve this, uh, specific uh, to duty to serve, um, uh, sorry, let me say that again. Uh, however, the enterprises cannot be expected to offer ambitious, ambitious plans until a specific duty to serve disincentives fostered by the previous FHFA director are rescinded and FHFA sends a clear message that duty to serve is to be taken seriously and it expects to see ambitious plans to better reach underserved markets if the enterprises are to receive approval for the proposed plans. As part of the first duty to serve plan cycle, Next Step and our partners have had the opportunity to work with both enterprises in furtherance of, the, in furtherance of their responsibility to serve the manufactured housing market. While recognizing the inadequacy of the proposed plans, we do see evidence of positive impact on low-income home ownership opportunities as a result of the enterprise's work thus far. Leveraging home that meet, homes that meet the specifications of the enterprise's manufactured home products, MH Advantage and Choice Home, we have seen successful projects, both executed and in our pipeline, that foster affordable, sustainable home ownership opportunity in communities across the country. However, the proposed plans do little to build on the momentum gained in leveraging manufactured homes as a scalable homeownership solution. The current targets as proposed in the enterprise's 2022 through 2024 plans are woefully inadequate to shift the market toward high quality, energy efficient manufactured homes that would allow households to build wealth and break entrenched cycles of poverty through home equity. In 2020, Freddie Mac purchased 6,634 single family manufactured home loans representing just 7% of new manufactured home shipments made that year. Fannie Mae's 8,798 loan purchases represented just 9% of manufactured home shipped. In reality, the percentage of new homes conforming to MH Advantage and Choice Home Specifications is even lower, as portions of the loan purchase volumes for both enterprises were refinances on existing homes. Yet both enterprises have set their manufactured home loan purchase volume targets for 2022 lower than the amount of loan purchases made in 2020. Meanwhile, according to census figures, the industry is already on pace to produce more homes in 2021 than in 2020. We urge FHFA to direct the enterprises to be aggressive in setting their targeted loan purchase volume. Our current housing needs certainly necessitate more, not less affordable home ownership opportunities. Next Step does commend the enterprise's proposed efforts to conduct outreach to key housing stakeholders that have not traditionally participated in this market, such as developers and realtors. Stakeholders such as these serve as gatekeepers to America's housing market and are key influencers to help change the perception of manufactured homes. Emphasis by the enterprises on facilitating loan financing and feasible developments is also critically important. Not only will this generate the opportunity for enhanced loan purchase volume, but also make meaningful progress toward addressing the current supply gap of more than 7 million affordable homes. We also recognize that purchase volumes are not the only way to move this market. Both enterprises should consider the needs of individuals seeking to purchase a manufactured home, particularly first-time home buyers, by investing in expanded access to housing counseling services and home buyer education. Prospective home buyers who receive education and counseling services are empowered to make the best finance and purchase decisions for themselves and their families, creating a path to greater prosperity through home ownership. The enterprises should also explore the impact of down payment assistance for manufactured home purchases to better facilitate the home ownership needs for families. A down payment remains the primary obstacle for 77% of first time home buyers. Our partners at Down Payment Resource report that only 26% of down payment assistance programs in their nationwide database allow for manufactured housing. The development of pilot programs in these spaces can help determine the effectiveness in creating more sustainable home ownership by leveraging counseling services and down payment assistance. The enterprises should also make explicit in their plans efforts to increase awareness of their manufactured home loan products to lower income communities of color and in immigrant communities. The inherent affordability of manufactured homes 
can help close the home ownership gap in these communities, fostering improved racial equity in the housing market. By building and supporting coalitions and community-based organizations, the enterprises can ensure that prospective manufactured home buyers have access to the tools and wraparound services they need to achieve home ownership success. In closing, to have meaningful impact on this market, FHFA must first act urgently to create a climate in which the enterprises can produce ambitious three-year plans. Second, the enterprises must be held to a far higher standard for ambitious plans that make tangible progress toward reaching the manufactured housing market than is reflected in the proposed, proposed plans for 2022 through 2024. Thank you again for this opportunity and for both FHFA and the enterprises continued work in this space. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Our next speaker is Mr. Bruce Thielen from Sun Communities. Thank you, Toy. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, just a, a brief introduction. Um, I'm Bruce Thielen, Executive Vice President at Sun Communities. Um, I'm responsible for the operations of our manufactured housing portfolio, which is comprised of 277 communities nationwide, providing safe, affordable housing to more than 300,000 people across the country is, is something that we take great pride in at Sun and something that we fully appreciate the responsibility that comes along with it. As a large publicly traded owner operator nationally, I can say unequivocally that the demand for high quality attainable housing is as high as it's ever been. Applications to live in our manufactured housing communities continues to run at more than 13 times the number of available sites. Our residents are seeing the value of living in a community that treats them fair and one that reinvests in the property. Our average tenure of a manufactured housing resident is over 14 years, which is double the national housing average. The greatest challenge that our resident population faces continues to be a lack of new supply coming onto the market. As Fannie states in their plan, the median household income of manufactured housing owners is about $40,000. That's half the median annual income of site-built homeowners. More than one-fifth of manufactured housing homeowners earn less than $20,000 annually. These are families that cannot afford to purchase a $350,000 entry-level single-family home at almost nine times household income. This has become a structural problem in our country that is making upward mobility more and more challenging. Manufactured housing is a time-tested proven solution to this problem as the largest form of unsubsidized attainable housing in the country. It is imperative that we make lower priced homes available for Americans everywhere. New development makes sense economically and socially. However, NIMBYism continues to restrict our ability to build the needed amount of new attainable housing units. This lack of development places an even greater burden on the lower income population that needs it most, driving up prices on existing inventory. I realize this is a larger issue than the underserved market plans can directly address. That said, we'd appreciate any effort that can be placed on the promotion of inclusive zoning across the country that would increase access to attainable housing. Focusing on, and this is a direct quote from the plan, the publication of research and resources and considerations of policy changes that respond to feedback um, is, is helpful. I'm pleased to see that local zoning restrictions called out as a challenge in both the Fannie and the, Fed, and the Freddie plans. However, we need more action. Related to the items in the 2022 to 24 plans, I believe the land lease community model is underrepresented underrepresented in the plans, despite being a direct solution to the needs of lower income households. The tangible lending activities in both Fannie and Freddie's plans are heavily weighted towards the land ownership model. While these activities are good steps, they will not address the growing need for housing in households that make less than $40,000. At Amazon, the second largest employer in the country, the median annual income is $29,007. Walmart, the largest employer in the country, is even less. Based on Freddie Mac's home affordability calculator, assuming a $10,000 down payment, which is a stretch at this income level, the median Amazon worker can only afford a home worth $62,000. This price point is simply not achievable in a scenario where the land is included, plus additional on-site requirements such as garages and some programs. Also, the fact that many of the housing needs in our country are in high cost markets where acquiring land places an even greater burden on the home buyer 
given the need for an increased down payment. When executed in a service-oriented, resident-focused way, the land lease model reduces the barrier to entry for many homeowners. This creates more owners building equity and less renters or families being left to live in high-density apartments. We believe duty to serve should focus on the consumer, more specifically those who are not being met by the market. The plans as currently presented fall short in this area. These plans just don't go far enough in increasing access to financing to individuals and families who wish, wish to purchase a manufactured home, especially at the lower price points. FHFA should ensure that Fannie and Freddie meet the statutory duty to serve for manufactured housing by increasing, not decreasing, their commitment to create a robust secondary market for all forms of manufactured housing. It is imperative that government financing be available for manufactured homes. It is the responsibility of the GSEs to meet this obligation, which will ultimately put more families in homes. I'm pleased to see that Fannie has noted this problem in the 2022 plan under outreach, but outreach doesn't go far enough. Consumers need action. In closing, I'd like to thank you for the time. We appreciate all the efforts to improve access to attainable housing, but frankly, so much more can be done. I look forward to continuing this ongoing dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thielen. Our next speaker is Mr. Nick Bertino from Wells Fargo. Mr. Bertino. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I apologize. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak today. I'm, my name is Nick Bertino and I am Managing Director with Wells Fargo Multifamily Capital Group specializing in agency financing uh, for manufactured home communities throughout the country. My comments today will be centered around the tenant pad lease protections that are now required by the FHFA in order for traditional MHCs to meet the definition of mission-driven affordable housing. While we certainly recognize the need for these protections and that most of them are pretty benign, we have been actively engaged in numerous conversations with MHC owners, as well as other agency lenders who have voiced concerns over a couple specific protections and some unintended consequences that could result from them, as well as the semantics involved in MHC owners implementing the protections and the lender's obligations to verify implementation. Our ultimate goal would be to make the implementation as easy as possible so that as many borrowers as possible participate in this program. As it currently stands, implementation of the lease protections is an owner's process for MHC owners due to the requirement that residents sign actual lease amendments or some other acknowledgement of the eight protections within 12 months of loan closing. Equally onerous is that the lender is required to perform a lease audit to confirm that the protections are in place, not only after the first year of the loan term, but each year thereafter. One concern MHC owners have is that despite the fact that these lease protections are clearly to the benefit of the residents, it's quite possible that some residents won't sign an amendment or acknowledgement. If this occurs, the MHC owner's loan can go into technical default, which can only be cured by the borrower paying a, mo a material monetary penalty for non-compliance with the lease protection program, despite the fact that their intent was to comply and they are prohibited from complying for reasons outside of their control. Now, when you boil it down, the eight lease protections are simply rights that the residents are entitled to and MHC owners are required to provide. Given this dynamic, it would be much more palatable for MHC owners to enter into this tenant pad lease protection program if the requirement is simply that they have to provide notice to the residents of the protections they are entitled to without the requirement of a counter signature from the residents. Not only would this alleviate the stress on the MHC owner and their management team to chase down residents for signatures, it would also alleviate ongoing audit requirements the lender is currently required to perform. We would propose that implementation of the lease protections be handled in one of two ways. Number one, require MHC owners to mail a notice of the lease protections to residents via certified mail. The signed mail receipts could then be provided to the loan servicers as verification that the residents have been provided the notice of the protections. Or number two, require MHC owners to post the lease protections in the property's leasing office, clubhouse, or other area within the property that is, accept that is accessible to all residents. 
a photo of the posted lease protections can then be provided to the lender as verification of implementation of the, of the protections. We would anticipate that eliminating the need for residents to physically sign lease amendments or acknowledgements of the protections would greatly increase MHC owner participation in the lease protection program. I'm going to switch gears now and uh, address one lease protection uh, specifically. Uh, as, as mentioned previously, the majority of lease protections have been met with little resistance from MHC owners, as many of them are already included in standard leases. One protection, however, comes up time and time again as being problematic for most MHC owners, and that is the provision that gives residents the right to sublease the manufactured homes. The main concern from MHC owners is a managerial one in that they feel it adversely affects their control over the property. While the sublease protection does mention that the sub lessee would have to meet the same credit standards as homeowner residents, the MHC owner is nonetheless typically one person removed from the sub lessee and there is really no way for the MHC owners to confirm that the sub lessor residents will adhere to their established credit and background checks, which could result in undesirable tenants residing at the properties. Another potential issue with subleasing, particularly in rent control communities, is that they may encourage investors to purchase homes with a specific intent to sublease them. If an investor were to purchase a home, they can then charge rent as high as the market will bear for that home thereby negating the affordability intended by the rent control ordinance in the first place. One final potential issue with subleasing is that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's current underwriting guidelines stipulate that only a limited percentage of sites within an MHC can be rentals. By allowing all residents, to MH, uh, all residents and MHCs to sublease, properties could easily exceed the current underwriting guideline since conceptually speaking, 100% of the homes could end up being rentals. In closing, the great majority of MHCs serve as either workforce housing for families or an affordable housing solution for seniors and retirees. Furthermore, MHC loans have performed exceptionally well from a credit quality standpoint. For these reasons, we believe the goal for both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac should be to increase their lending volume within the MHC sector. By making the implementation of tenant site lease protections as seamless as possible, we can continue to support borrowers who provide affordable housing throughout the country. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bettino. Our next speaker is Mr. Maxwell Baker um, from the Mobile Home Buyer Broker. Mr. Baker, are you on the line? Mr. Baker, if you're on the line, please um, try to raise your hand or chat. Um, We'll move on to the next speaker, uh, meanwhile, um, and, and circle back to Mr. Baker. All right, so next speaker is Mr. Todd Kopstein from Cascade Financial. Thank you, Tori. Uh, my name is Todd Kopstein. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Cascade Financial. We are a lender to people to buy manufactured housing. So we've been in the market since 1999. We lend FHA, we lend VA, we lend chattel, we lend a non-agency mortgage. We are a Freddie seller servicer and we do third-party servicing as well. So we are everything manufactured housing. Uh, and thank you for having me speak again. This is my third time speaking in this, in this forum. Uh, I guess I have three comments with respect to, with respect to the enterprise's plans. Uh, and I ask you to step back uh, and with some perspective Think about uh, with the platforms that you have, the opportunity that you have to really make a dent in the uh, affordability crisis or the housing crisis we have in our country. I commend you on your efforts to date. Uh, they've certainly helped incrementally, but I think we have a huge crisis in our country and it's not getting any better, uh, but you all have uh, the power to make a big difference. So I would ask you, as you listen to my comments, Think about it from a bigger picture as opposed to tweaking these plans. Think about rethinking the plans in such a way that you really can move the needle. So my first comment, uh, I would say, is stepping back to basically what I said the first time around when I spoke in this forum, which is to say you really need to focus on chattel buyers. That uh, is the majority of people who buy homes in manufactured housing. These are the lowest income borrowers. Uh, the people need your help the most and the least loved by traditional lenders. Uh, the way I think the right answer is for, for you to do this is just as I said 
uh, a couple of years back, which is to say, do exactly what you do for site built borrowers. Do a credit risk transfer transaction where the lender uh, will keep skin in the game, the bottom of the capital structure, retain the credit risk, and the enterprises can guarantee the top of the capital structure and bring down the liquidity risk or help pass through financing savings to the borrowers ultimately. Um, this is straightforward. It's what you do already. And in fact, the private sector has already priced it for you. So you can use that as a guidepost. Cascade has done two securitizations to date, uh, the most recent of which was in March of this year, which got rated by the rating agencies. And you can see exactly how the private sector priced that risk. And you can use that as a guidepost. So the data exists for the private sector. It ought to exist for uh, the GSEs. This should not be a struggle. Okay. Uh, the second suggestion I have uh, gets back to what I spoke about last time is uh, on research efforts. I commend you in what I've read uh, as to what each of the enterprises has done or is doing with respect to research, both academic research and empirical research on manufactured housing. Uh, Fannie commissioned a research firm to rank markets where MH Advantage would fit well. I simply encourage you to make that data public. Arm those of us that can make a difference with the data. Uh, it seems like that data has gone to a limited few, but uh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Freddie wrote that they would perform a quantitative analysis to identify markets that currently receive no manufactured home shipments yet offer a significant opportunity. I think that's a great project. If that's been done, I haven't seen anything about it. It hasn't been done yet. Please, when it's completed, uh, share it with the whole community. Uh, I think it could really make a difference. And lastly, the enterprises uh, have done some empirical research, which is to say that they've tested waivers or product changes uh, in order to help uh, with certain lenders in order to help the product do better. Uh, please share specifically what you've done and how you've measured success uh, or failure with those. Help us, uh, other participants in the marketplace, figure out how to move the ball. What, what are the things that are moving the needle that you've learned uh, as opposed to just sharing it with those few lenders and with FHFA Share it with the public. Uh, the data can go so much further. So I, uh, that is the second suggestion. I really encourage you to make as much information public as possible. The last suggestion is just to lean in. So uh, in your mortgage purchases, uh, I ask you to rethink how you go about doing that. Uh, when Cascade goes to sell FHA and VA loans in our Gini pools, we go to a universe of private buyers and they pay a significant premium for manufactured housing pools than they do for site built pools because they recognize there's extra value in those pools. Uh, and that becomes, that's because of the muted prepayment option. Uh, so there's a real premium that ought to get paid for them. And they do. Uh, if I want to sell loans to Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, I get a discount. There's a loan level pricing adjustment discount. In other words, I pay less than TBA for selling a manufactured housing loan. That's crazy. Uh, I, I, you should be helping us, not hurting us. Uh, you should be paying more, not less. Uh, so I ask you to, to rethink that. Uh, either rethink that, or uh, as you think through the guarantor fee, let us go find the investors that will pay more. We'll, we're happy to do that, but bring down our, our guarantee fees. That way you can pass through the economics to us as well. So I ask you to think about decreasing margin, which is already uh, substantial for manufactured housing, and helping us think through how to pass through that margin on onto uh, the borrowers. So those are my three suggestions. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for everything you've done thus far and duty to serve. I really do think you can make a difference if you think back and step back uh, and say, how do I really solve this housing crisis using manufactured housing? And I think when you do that, you will recognize that these plans don't do quite enough yet. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kopstein. Um, we did get a message um, for um, about Mr. Baker um, from the mobile home buyer broker. Unfortunately, he will not be joining us today. So I just wanted to um, state that before we move on. Um, and our next speaker is Mr. Garth Ryman from the National Council of State Housing Agencies. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the FHFA and enterprise folks on this listening session today for holding it and for the work that you all do on the duty to serve program and Fannie Mae's and Freddie Mac's underserved market plans. 
Um, it's good to see you again. Uh, we've been busy this week and we're glad today to provide some feedback from NCSHA on behalf of our members on manufactured housing issues. I won't belabor the points that I've made over the last two days regarding the importance of restoring the HFA preferred products, eliminating the PSPA volume caps on important affordable housing loan products, or promoting housing bond purchases and the need for product innovation and flexibility, but these are all critical issues and apply squarely to manufactured housing as well as to other underserved markets. State HFAs recognize that manufactured housing can and should play an increasing role in addressing our nation's affordable housing crisis. Manufactured housing is naturally occurring affordable housing that often offers lower income families affordable long-term housing with no or minimal subsidy. Manufactured housing provides an affordable alternative to many families with lower average incomes than other buyers and who purchase homes priced below what is available in the stick-built market. However, manufactured housing can still pose affordability challenges for some potential home buyers and renters. Of particular concern are high interest loans for home buyers that don't have access to other loan product options and high and escalating rents in manufactured housing communities without affordability restrictions and supports. In addition, Poor heating and cooling can make some manufactured homes unsafe and unaffordable. 28 state HFAs reported in NCSHA's annual survey that they directly originate or purchase manufactured housing loans. Several HFAs have significantly expanded their manufactured housing activities in recent years and are ready to do more. Some of these HFAs offer home buyers affordable manufactured housing financing options through special partnerships with the enterprises driven by their duty to serve market plans. So I agree that we're making progress, but I also think that um, we can continue to do more and to do better. Some HFAs directly originate loans for manufactured housing titled as real estate and are looking for good outlets for those loans. And some HFAs are natural partners for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as they work on their duty to serve plans in the manufactured housing area as well as the others. And both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are currently working with many HFAs to meet their duty to serve obligations and trying to increase the number of an activity in these partnerships. We encourage the enterprises to keep seeking out opportunities to collaborate with HFAs and to continue their regular communication with NCSHA and our members. We appreciate these efforts, but believe the enterprises can and should do more to support manufactured housing than the proposals they have put forward in their market plans. We urge the enterprises to increase liquidity for manufactured housing through higher loan purchase goals for manufactured housing loans, increased industry outreach, product variances, policy changes, energy efficiency and retrofit financing products, and continued manufactured housing community loan purchases. We also encourage the enterprises to develop and enhance chattel loan products to establish healthy channels for prudent, sustainable, and consumer-oriented chattel loans. The enterprises should also continue working with HFAs to expand credit for affordable manufactured housing communities. Much manufactured housing is located in resident owned and privately owned parks and communities. The enterprises can and should prudently lend more to buyers and homeowners in these parks and communities. But the enterprise's manufactured home community engagement must prioritize long-term affordability and racial and social equity. Providing liquidity without safeguards could hurt people the duty to serve program is intended to help. We also recommend FHFA and the enterprises inspect their lending guidelines to identify credit, income, asset, appraisal, and home design criteria changes 
that could encourage more manufactured housing lending. We also ask FHFA to consider allowing the enterprises to receive duty to serve credit for housing credit investments that support development or acquisition of manufactured housing communities for affordable housing purposes. NCSHA also urges FHFA to consider how it could amend the duty to serve requirements for housing bond purchases to give the enterprises and HFAs more flexibility in using proceeds from purchases of these bonds to support manufactured housing lending and other activities, and to encourage the enterprises to include such activity in their underserved market plans. Several HFAs have suggested the enterprise increase the promotion of their manufactured housing products to borrowers, lenders, and realtors, perhaps even offering financial incentives to lenders and buyers to expand interest in these programs. We encourage FHFA to authorize the enterprises to provide grants to manufactured housing market leaders. These grants enable experts to build awareness, get more parks and communities approved, and build the capacity of manufactured housing advisors and consumer-oriented organizations. One minute remaining. Thank you. Manufactured housing offers a great resource for people who need affordable housing and good business for the enterprises, but is woefully short of its potential. We hope the enterprises, FHFA, HFAs, and others can close that gap and realize more of that potential in the coming months and years. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, Mr. Larry. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker is Mr. Adam Russ from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Thank you, good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you for today's opportunity to participate. My name is Adam Rust. I'm a senior policy advisor for the National Community Reinvestment Coalition and formerly a member of the Manufactured Housing Consensus Committee. Today, I will outline my organization's concerns for the proposed underserved markets plan. First, with regard to loan products. While Choice Home and MH Advantage are attractive products, neither has found meaningful uptake in the market, and the situation calls for reform. The status quo is not workable, but moving on to an entirely new set of aims is also a mistake. The agencies should redesign these products, maintaining their flexible underwriting structures to be used for high quality homes that can still be produced and purchased at scale to support price appreciation and wealth building. It starts with the cost of the homes. MHI has estimated that a choice home can cost between $175,000 and $250,000 when including the cost of land. So this is an engineering problem. The standard is unaffordable unless the agencies have missed an opportunity to expand home ownership among low-income households. But the answer is not to shift, shift course to a new product plan. If we keep the end in mind, which is to create opportunities for wealth building, the aspiration must be to maintain the support and availability of a low cost, flexible loan product for well-made homes that will appreciate. Frederick Mack has proposed new targets for loan products when it should instead reimagine choice home. And while finding a product for tribal areas is a worthy objective, it is not one that should be mutually exclusive with Freddie Mac's prior work streams, and also one that is admittedly much narrower in scope. It's a restart at a time when there is still unfinished business. Fannie Mae has proposed to research fee simple products, launch a pilot, but it does not have a purchase target for 2024 and only says that it will conduct a market feasibility study, which raises the question of how seriously Fannie Mae is taking this effort and how likely they think it is to succeed. With loan purchase target targets, Freddie Mac should increase its purchase targets using a baseline derived from its prior three years with a commitment to increasing volume in each year of the plan. Freddie Mac's loan purchase target is a strategic and unsatisfactory under promise built on the choice to use a baseline of 4,300 loans based on a five-year average, even though the DTS evaluation guidances identify a three-year baseline as the default way to assess a target. The low target permits it to buy fewer loans than it did in two of the prior three years and still to never exceed 2,000, it's two thirds of its 2020 volume. Freddie Mac should instead use a baseline from the prior three years with the same 5% growth rate as proposed by Fannie Mae, 
leading to targets of 5,375, 5,650, and 5,925 purchases. The commitment by both agencies for tenant pad lease protection, protections is significant and very impactful and we support it. And the next step is to strengthen certain tenant pad lease protections. Specifically, tenant pad lease protection eight, which calls for a right to receive at least a 60 days notice of a community sale is too short. In reality, this is not enough time for a community to qualify for financing. The notice period should be expanded to 120 days. And yes, this is a regulatory fix, but nonetheless one that FHA, FHFA should immediately pursue. Relatedly, it is counterproductive to purchase manufactured housing community loans with TPL protections but elsewhere to buy MHC loans that will facilitate rent increases and mass evictions. Currently, the GSEs purchase loans used to buy MHCs from firms with a demonstrated track record of substantial rent increases, as much as 70%, along with high fees and potentially illegal leases. Neither GSC should facilitate these transactions. The GSCs may actually be playing a role in mass evictions, which should be perceived as harmful and counterproductive to its duty to serve obligations, not just for manufactured housing, but also for rural housing. FHA, FHFA should immediately direct the enterprises to quit offering MH loans to borrowers who engage in this type of behavior. And if that can't easily be determined, then quit offering loans that don't meet the minimum TPL protections. It should provide grants for technical assistance to resident groups seeking to buy MHCs and investments to provide equity for the acquisition of ROCs. The problem is that resident groups have very little time to organize to buy their park upon notice of intent to sell. And if they do, they become debt burdened. To give potential rock groups the time they need to organize, it will be valuable if the GSEs could provide grants to agile technical assistance teams. These teams could arrive on site, convey options for financing, and provide some of the professional services that are necessary to become a rock. And the GSEs should also provide grants and investments to ROC groups to create equity, because to succeed, ROCs often need additional capital, capital for purchase and rehab. And while foundations can provide some funds, going to scale is fundamentally constrained. And I recognize that this is an ask that reflects a strategic shift of how resources are allocated. But at the moment, the enterprises are more profitable and far, far enough profitable to justify the expense. Similar TA and equity support should be provided for nonprofit buyers as well. Last, with outreach and research, the proposed plans fail to, indicate, fail to indicate how the GSEs will implement the research from the prior three-year term and also if they will make findings public. Three areas of inquiry seem particularly pressing, the uptake of loan products, the safety of loans, and the needs for additional market interventions. The discrepancy in the quality of financing may be the greatest disadvantage for the manufactured housing sector compared to stick-built housing, but given the affordability of these, these homes generally, the lack of quality financing is a primary obstacle to preventing the sector from supporting the wealth building needs through home ownership. Second, how to make safer loans. Freddie Mac's decade in review paper focused on loan performance, but it was merely descriptive. It did not propose solutions. Important solutions that deserve to be considered include the question of do protections for loss mitigations, workouts, foreclosure preventions, and home buyer education lead to improved borrower outcomes, and can strong protections enhance profitability? Third, determining if and how the agencies could use their market power to address known problems that may fall outside of the agency's traditional set of institutional priorities, which but which could support its goals for affordable and sustainable home ownership nonetheless. The agencies should consider how it can address problems with distressed units and even with entirely abandoned communities as both undermine the sector and wealth building for its residents. And in some cases, the economic development efforts of surrounding regions as well, given that manufactured home purchases by black home buyers are only half as likely as those bought by white buyers to be secured by land it should explore the implications for the agency's chattel policies and how they relate to racial equity and to the racial wealth gap. Less than one minute remaining. The market power of the GSEs can be a strong force for reform. And to those ends, it's essential that the GSEs do fulfill their obligations. We're calling on the GSEs to reform their loan product with meaningful and strong targets to align their rock and nonprofit loan purchases with known needs 
to increase protections against aggressive rent increases in manufactured housing communities, and to use the research program to lead on overall sectoral reform. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rust. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Mark Weiss from Manufactured Housing Association for Regulatory Reform. Thank you, Ty. Uh, my name is Mark Weiss. I'm president and CEO of the Manufactured Housing Association for Regulatory Reform. MHARR, based here in Washington, D.C., represents independent producers of manufactured housing regulated under federal law. Uh, our member companies are located in and produce homes sold in all regions of the United States. The full market significant implementation of uh, the duty to serve by Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac within the entire manufactured housing market, including home only, personal property or chattel loans, is, is absolutely essential to achieve the congressionally mandated remedial purposes and objectives of DTS to begin resolving the nation's affordable housing crisis and to end discriminatory impacts within the, within the existing manufactured housing consumer financing system. DTS was adopted by Congress as a remedy for decades of discrimination by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac against the manufactured housing consumer financing market and the mostly lower and moderate income purchasers who rely on, the, on inherently affordable manufactured housing. Uh, as FHFA is, is aware, DTS was designed to expand the manufactured housing consumer financing market which has been artificially and needlessly constrained, limited and restricted by a lack of enterprise support. Unfortunately though, sadly, within the, the, at least within the manufactured housing market, it hasn't worked out that way. And now with the enterprise's second set of DTS implementation plans under consideration by FHFA, it's well past the point where they can legitimately claim uh, or allege that they have not had sufficient time to study the market or that they still somehow lack needed information. By my count, this will be the fifth time that I've addressed an FHFA duty to serve listening session concerning the manufactured housing market. And MHAR has filed written comments more times than that. We've also met with and spoken to every FHFA director and acting director regarding DTS and its implementation, <coughs> excuse me, since the agency was established. Uh, finally, in 2020, in a series of meetings with now Director Thompson, MHARR and its members with specific facts, figures, and information were able to show, we believe, that the so-called implementation of duty to serve by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to date is not helping and will not help the lower and moderate income uh, will not help lower and moderate income Americans access inherently affordable manufactured housing and expand the overall manufactured housing market. So as we speak today, duty to serve remains an unfulfilled promise for the vast majority of the manufactured housing market and the, and the vast majority of actual and potential manufactured home buyers, people who in, in many, if not most cases, are unable to afford a more costly site-built home and for whom mainstream affordable manufactured housing represents the only chance and opportunity to become a homeowner. Manufactured homes uh, are by definition affordable homes. They're expressly recognized as affordable by federal law. Uh, and according to a May 2021 report by the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, Quote, manufactured housing is the largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing in the country, close quote. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, though, have failed to implement DTS with respect to the vast bulk of the mainstream manufactured housing market. According to U.S. Census Bureau data, home only or chattel loans in 2019, the last year for which uh, such data is available, Chattel loans finance 76% of all manufactured home placements, while only 19% of manufactured homes were titled and financed as real property. Since the inception of duty to serve, however, neither Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac 
uh, have purchased or provided support for any manufactured home personal property loans. And now in their 2022 to 2024 implementation plans, they've dropped any plans uh, for the support of such loans and the lower and moderate income home buyers who rely on them to access the industry's most affordable homes. Um, consequently, the enterprise's initial 2018 to 2020 plans, their 2021 extensions, and now their 2022 to 2024 plans have provided and still provide no DTS support whatsoever. Uh, and again, I think that is support for the vast bulk of the manufactured housing market. And even within the, the extremely small manufactured housing real estate market, the DTS footprint of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac has been wholly insufficient. So the question becomes just who's hurt by the lack of a fully competitive DTS compliant GSE supported manufactured housing market. And we now have the, the answer, that information from CFPB. Hurt first and foremost are those people who are totally excluded from the market and from home ownership altogether by the lack of DTS support. According to the May 2021 CFPB report uh, that I alluded to earlier, the majority of manufactured housing loan applications do, <coughs> excuse me, do not result in, don't result in an origination. Only 27% of all MH loan applications result in a home being financed compared to 74% for site built homes. And who does this hurt the most? The CFPB report found that, quote, Hispanic, white, black, and African-American and American Indian and Alaska native borrowers make up larger shares of chattel loan borrowers than among MH mortgage loan borrowers or among site built loan borrowers. Further to this point, the report states that, quote, black and African-American borrowers are the only racial group that is overrepresented in manufactured home chattel lending compared to site built. Consequently, the lack of any DTS chattel support by the enterprises disproportionately impacts and harms Afri African Americans and other minorities. This is directly contrary to the policy initiatives outlined by President Biden in his Executive Order 13895, titled Executive Order on Advancing Racial Equity and Support for Underserved Communities. It also I would also point you to the policy statement on fair lending issued by Acting Director Thompson just a few days ago. That statement notes FHA, quote, FHA is committed to ensuring that its regulated entities operate consistently with the public interest by providing fair, equitable, and non-discriminatory access to credit and housing. FHFA should, and in our view, must reject Fannie and Freddie's 2020 to 2024 proposed plans and direct both entities to undertake immediate action designed to facilitate and implement market significant secondary market and securitization support for all types of manufactured housing consumer loans, specifically including home only personal property loans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Our next speaker is Mr. Doug Ryan from Prosperity Now. Thank you, Tori. Good afternoon, I'm Doug Ryan with Prosperity Now, a DC-based national nonprofit. We run the Innovations in Manufactured Homes program, the I'm Home program, an initiative that has been improving public policy, housing finance, and resident security in manufactured housing since 2005. Thank you to FHFA for hosting these listening sessions. This is always a good opportunity to hear from the, hear the perspectives of my colleagues in the sector, and more importantly, seeing how Fannie and Freddie use these sessions and the written comments coming later this week to improve and implement their duty to serve plans in 2022 to 2024. New leadership at the FHFA also offers an opportunity to the enterprises to innovate and expand their product offerings. The FHFA and the enterprise should take full advantage of this new opportunity to fully implement the statute. In general, the duty to serve proposed plans for 22-24 do not go far enough and should be expanded to address the affordable housing crisis that is only getting worse and the worsening racial wealth divide in this country. To do so, the FHFA should 
rescind duty to serve disincentives issued by the previous FHFA director. Otherwise, innovation and frankly, accomplishments of the duty to serve goals as that which should be expanded will be unlikely. The FHFA should promulgate an interim rule that revises the enterprise capital requirements. The FHFA should also repeal its long loan level price adjustments on underserved markets and revisit its unnecessary PSPA limits on so-called high-risk loans. Each of these will impact the availability of credit to the manufactured housing market. The new products rule should also not be finalized. In fact, the FHFA should release guidance to encourage new pilots and products, which are the only realistic means for the enterprises to reach the underserved markets, including manufactured housing. Similarly, the FHFA should state clearly that the statute permits targeted equity investments to reach the underserved markets. This is simply a plain reading of the law as enacted by Congress and signed by the president. Equity investments could support new mortgage products, including soft secondary mortgages and community purchases. As we emerge from this pandemic, the housing crisis is worse than ever. The threats of evictions and foreclosures hang over many communities. FHFA and the enterprises have done well to mitigate this during the past 15 months, but much more is needed. Prosperity Now and I'm Home appreciate the work the enterprises have, have logged to meet their obligations in the MH sector, but there's much more to be done. Both enterprises exceeded their 2020 targets for purchasing manufactured housing mortgages, real estate mortgages, but their proposed goals in the current, in the proposed three-year plan must be significantly greater. Continued increases in this area will reduce costs to homeowners, extend potential GSE related benefits and improve the acceptance of these homes in the marketplace and communities across the country. I made similar comments in October, in the October 2020 listening session, yet that's in the challenges remain in place. As noted by the enterprises in their plans, the limits to manufactured home production of various types constrains the growth of the GSE's footprints. That's true. Zoning, a real serious issue that has to be addressed, tariffs, immigration rules that, that impact labor are significant strain, constraints that must be resolved. The industry itself is struggling to meet consumer demand. That said, the goals for manufactured home mortgages, mortgage purchases must be much more aggressive. <clears throat> the measure of goals should not be simply to raise over past goal figures as the enterprises propo propose, but to exceed the loan purchase volumes of previous years. There are programmatic options consistent with safety and soundness with explicit, which would benefit from explicit guidance from their regulator that the enterprises can employ to expand their reaches in this mortgage market. The enterprise should continue to support the use of manufactured housing in new subdivisions, as is mentioned a couple of times, uh, particularly by Esther Sullivan at the opening, but at an accelerated pace. For example, dozens of states and localities have inclusionary zoning rules. And for example, manufactured homes could be key to delivering affordability in new developments subject to IZ, and they could do a lot more. The enterprise purchases of refinancing loans also serves this market. Fannie has proposed ending including these in their goals, while Freddie appears to continue to do so. I understand Fannie's explanation, but I disagree with it. For example, according to the CFPB's May report on manufactured housing finance, Refinancing continues to lag the market. Mortgage rates remain historically low. Existing homeowners would benefit immensely if refinancing is a robust component of duty to serve. There are of course other avenues that the GSEs should pursue to expand their role. Uh, for example, they should make more accessible single closing loan products. These types of loans remove barriers to many home buyers, particularly low and moderate income ones. To further the, also to further the impact of DTS, the enterprises also need to expand credit access for buyers and owners of single section homes, which prevail in many markets. Older homes should also be better served by the enterprises, and they also are in great demand, again, as some of the earlier speakers have noted. FHFA should also require that the enterprises report due to serve progress using the same format. I, mean, I mentioned this in previous comments in previous years, but it remains a frustrating component of the, of the program. As for chattel loans, we understand that new research from the CFPB that I just noted suggests that chattel loans are, contrary to other reporting, accounting for fewer than half the, more, the manufactured housing mortgages uh, in that year, 2019 that was looked at. Nevertheless, it remains disappointing, but not surprising that the enterprises do not include this from their 22-24 plan. I get that. One minute, Reverend. 
while community development financial institutions and HFAs do great work in the space, the GSEs must enter this space as part of their planning process. They must revise their plans in order to serve this market, and they, which they can do soundly and safely. We also strongly support the development of mission-driven ownership of manufactured housing communities, which is a small market, but no doubt they provide security and long-term benefits to residents that are not available in the for-profit owned space. They also offer more robust lease protections. The enterprises must support their community purchases through financing and refinancing. Though the market is limited, they can, the GSE should increase their, their goals in this space. And on the components of the lease pad protections, duty to serve, the duty to serve pro, uh, pro, uh, goal must be in, in, in improved. For example, lease protections are they're solid, they're good, but they can be expanded. An opportunity to purchase components should be part of it, as should a notification of rent increases, a rent increase justification based on the CPI should be included as well. FHFA must provide internal rules and guidance to support the enterprises to develop innovative and ambitious three-year duty to serve plans. To truly meet their statutory obligations, the enterprises should revise and expand on these proposals, which should be held to a fire, far higher standard than in past years. Thank you for this time this afternoon. I understand we're discussing some difficult points, but thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Okay, so that now leads us to our short break session, um, just seven minutes. Uh, so at this time, we will resume back at 2.32. Okay, all right, so welcome back. Um, and we'll now get into the second half of hearing from our guest speakers. Uh, the next speaker we'll hear from is Mr. Pa Paul Barreto from Learn MH. Thank you, uh, thank you to FHA. Uh, thank you to FHFA, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for the opportunity to share my thoughts and comments on the draft of the next iteration of duty to serve for manufactured housing. Having written the first plan while at Fannie Mae and now serving as executive director for LearnMH, which is a platform to educate, inform, and advance factory built housing, I can see the progression being made and I hope my comments enable the GSEs to meet their goals and help the industry dispel the myths of manufactured housing. Recognizing that the GSEs bring scale to manufactured housing only titled as real property, I agree with their focus and their focus being expanding policies to, be more, to buy more manufactured home loans and address the myths and bias that still exist within the housing industry. We'd like to get to the point out there where a home is a home and to get there, we ask you to do more. It's about expanding the population of conventional lenders selling MH loans and increasing the amount of MH loans being sold by participating lenders. 
So a couple of points I'd like to, to touch on, uh, first being credit policy. Uh, it's important to continue removing any remaining policy um, snags where you're limiting single wide homes being treated any differently than any comparable single family site built homes. As was said earlier, they are an important part to the affordable housing equation and uh, the limitations provided that they, they value out similarly um, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be excluding them in particular. Uh, there should be a focus on responsibly growing manufactured homes as community land trusts. That will provide the data uh, that's needed in order to build out more product flexibilities and maybe eventually venture into working with, with uh, standard manufactured housing communities. Uh, there's changes that are happening with respect to the HUD code. The HUD code will be supportive. Uh, the new HUD code, which is actually coming out, I believe, this week, will be supporting two to four unit uh, manufactured homes, townhomes as manufactured, manufactured homes as townhomes, and two story manufactured homes. All of these property types that are available options in uh, single family lending should apply to manufactured housing as well. So I'm hoping that. The selling guides from both GSEs are prepared to accommodate that so that it will facilitate the manufacturers and the consumer demand to start using the two to four unit townhome and two story manufactured home um, property types in order to build out the opportunities in urban infill and support overall affordable housing. With respect to appraisals, um, there's a lot that's been done. I think it's important to recognize the efforts that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have made given the fact that they are the ones responsible for doing the securitization. It's a fine line in terms of telling the entity or the industry that is supposed to provide the proper valuation how to do it uh, when they're supposed to be the subject matter experts. So, so my applause for, for the efforts that are being made, but I request that there's a more aggressive delivery to address the friction points for praising not only MH Advantage and Choice Home, but manufactured homes in general. Um, the reason why training is important is because more appraisers need, um, need the understanding, need the materials to help them um, comfortable in actually taking advantage of what exists today in both GSC policies, particularly when it comes to using non-manufactured homes as comparables. With respect to the topic of zoning, um, it, it, there was a, a great effort being made and a great example of what can be done in terms of GSC supports. Uh, in the state of Florida, where Fannie Mae provided resources to state that they support manufactured housing. Uh, there was no um, political intent or no lobbying. It was the fact that this business is good business for the GSEs and that they support it. That started changing the thought and the thinking for the town council, the zoning boards, and those that have the hesitation of manufactured housing are quite frankly unaware of the capabilities of today's manufactured housing. The simple uh, ability to provide resources and make them available to the state associations at the local level will help them address at a local level the different zoning challenges that they face. Uh, with respect to multifamily, um, there's a lot that's being done and yeah, I support the comments that have been made before me, but I would ask that the GSEs also focus on the expansion of the new communities that are coming online. There are new entrants um, such as Casada that are very focused theme-based driven uh, affordable housing opportunities. And um, I would ask that both GSEs focus on the new entrants that are coming in and help expand and, and create the competition for housing. Uh, the big topic that seems to have come up a lot is, is chattel. And regarding chattel, I recognize the limits that have been imposed on the GSEs, but uh, I propose that they, they don't just stop with the work that they've done. There's a lot that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac know and that they can offer in terms of support. So why not use their capabilities as consultants? Because the real issue is in order to create a sustainable secondary market for chattel, it's gotta be led by the industry. The industry has to be able to do the simple things like create a standard data set, create a repository, share the information in order to be able to move forward Without those resources being available, it's very difficult for the GSEs to do anything other than maybe buy sample loans um, and then see how they test out. Um, I uh, applaud the efforts being done by Cascade, having done their second securitization. That should serve as a model to others in the industry, but there should be opportunities where Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can come in and support. Uh, there are a lot of connections, a lot of 
everyday business relationships that could be incorporated provided that there's that motivation and there's that industry coordination that occurs. And I believe there's a sustainable solution out there for chattel. Um, I believe the GSC should play a role, but I don't think they are the specific answer. So in closing, uh, my request is that the GSC stay aggressive in their commitment, focus on innovation and evolution, take what policies exist now and keep pushing. Make sure that the evolution that's occurring in manufactured housing today, simply because of the housing gap that exists, uh, be addressed and, and do it in a way that is beyond the expectation. Focus on the mission, because essentially what it is, is affordable housing. And that's what both Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are good at doing. So I ask that FHFA support their efforts, uh, give them more latitude and, and more capabilities to be able to do what they do best and then see what happens. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Barreto. Our next speaker is Mr. George Allen from Educate MHC. Good afternoon, everyone. It's been a very interesting, uh, well, almost three hours now as to the speakers we've already heard. I've been busily making notes, even wishing there was a way of stopping, maybe revise like, parts of my talk, but that's not possible, so I'll proceed as I was originally intended. Uh, just to let you know a little bit about myself, <coughs> I'm a CPM certified property manager emeritus and an emeritus member of the Manufacturing Housing Institute. I'm just coming off of 40 years of land and community ownership. I'm an author of all the major textbooks that are presently in print relative to manufactured housing and what I prefer to call land lease communities as opposed to mobile home parks or manufactured home communities. And um, I also publish the annual or have for 33 years, the annual Allen Report, which is a who's who of the 500 portfolio owners of land lease communities throughout the US and Canada. But with that said, uh, my way of a little historic background to where we are today with the FHFA and the GSEs, uh, I had the, um, wasn't the pleasure, but the honor of being present at a, ninth, at a 2010 meeting, that's, 20, that's 11 years ago, in Elkhart, Indiana, when national manufactured housing leaders were told by representatives from the FHFA and both GSEs that henceforth the industry was on its own when it came to home only chattel loans. The following, this followed, followed, you know, followed the year 2009 when new home shipments hit a record low of only 48,789 units. That was down from 372,943 a decade earlier. So in other words, we were really on rough times at the time and there were good reasons for why FHFA and, and uh, GSE distanced themselves at that time from the manufactured housing industry. However, Soon thereafter, Congress passed legislation requiring Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to affect under, underserved market duty to serve plans on three foci, one of which is, of course, manufactured housing, which is why we're talking today. A year after that, at, a, at the networking roundtable I hosted in Peachtree, Georgia, the same federal entities re-entered manufactured housing after only departing a year, year and a half earlier. Uh, basically with promises relative to guaranteeing uh, realty secured mortgages, as well as sourcing and developing a secondary market for home only loans. Since then, however, the manufacturing industry has endured weak DTS promises to these ends. During several public listening sessions in Washington, DC, St. Louis, Missouri, and now virtually, uh, now virtually both Bottom line result for me in this whole situation is I do not believe the proposed 2022-24 underserved DTS market plans address Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's statutory requirements to serve manufactured housing and call upon the FHFA to hold the enterprises accountable. Specifically, duty to serve requires the enterprises to meet the needs of underserved consumers in manufactured housing. 
yet the plans do little to expand financing options at this time. Although both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac included commitments in their three-year DTS plans to create a secondary market for chattel financing, to date, neither enterprise has purchased any chattel loans. Furthermore, the 22 to 2024 DTS plans do not include any objectives to purchase chattel uh, loans by either entity. They also do not significantly increase the financing for loans titled as real property. This was not the intent of Congress for meeting the affordable home ownership needs of the manufactured housing market. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac need to reaffirm their previous commitment to buying and automatically create a flow and securitization program for travel loans and to expand financing for manufactured homes for all qualified consumers. Now, these letter remarks on the most part were borrowed from uh, communicate from the Manufactured Housing Institute. I do want to make a uh, close with this uh, one positive, very positive comment. The listing sessions do make a difference. It was in the listing session in St. Louis that I came out from uh, not only myself, but another land lease community owner uh, from Atlanta about the presence, increasing presence of predatory landlords. Uh, companies from outside the industry are coming in and, and basically overpaying for land lease communities and having those loans uh, guaranteed by one or another of the GSEs. Well, when that information came out, it wasn't too long after, uh, after that that we learned of the um, tenant protections that you've been hearing about today. And they came as a direct result, at least in my mind, as that uh, from that listening session when, when the uh, FHMA and the GSEs learned that what was really happening on the ground with some of the loans that they had underscored, uh, they had guaranteed. So my point is, is that this is a worthwhile, a worthwhile effort on the part of the FHA and FHFA and GSEs. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and look forward to what the remainder speakers have to say and what the results are that come out of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Our next speaker is Ms. Jennifer Hopkins from New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. Thank you for having me and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, established in 1983, the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund was one of the first community development financial institutions in the nation providing loans and technical assistance to extend the reach of conventional lenders. And one of our strong strategies is transforming the manufactured housing sector to better serve people with low incomes, supporting both resident owned communities or ROCs and also owners of manufactured homes. We focus on manufactured housing because it's among the most affordable home ownership options yet can fall through the cracks in the federal housing picture. We believe affordable manufactured homes are a workforce housing solution, but the current affordable housing crisis means there are not nearly enough homes for sale or rent, and manufactured homes are part of that solution. While the median home in New Hampshire now costs uh, $409,000, the median price for a manufactured home is $85,000, less than a quarter of the price. So we applaud the GSE's efforts to move manufactured homes into the more mainstream look and feel with MH Advantage and Home Possible loans. This may help end some of the stigma that people feel about the visual design of manufactured homes. But those programs have modeled homes that can leave out a group of people that's important to keep centered in our work. That is people buying at the more modest end of the manufactured home price range. We also have seen a boom in placing and financing new manufactured homes on vacant lots and encourage more focus in this area to create more inventory of manufactured homes, especially at a price point that working people can afford. CDFIs can be more flexible in reaching unmet community needs like these. And if this is not an area where the GSEs can lend, we would encourage them to provide grant money uh, to help CDFIs like us to fill the mortgage lending needs in those niches. One uh, area is to expand the use of real estate mortgage financing for manufactured homes. Because there is a very limited mortgage market, people wishing to purchase a manufactured home face major barriers to home ownership using predatory chattel loans or high down payment, high interest rate, harsh prepayment penalties, 
really the lack of liquidity for home buyers depresses the, the asset value for home sellers. And while the innovation needed in the market is not any special treatment, it is fair access to conventional mortgage financing for manufactured homes that's really needed. There are still parts of the enterprise's mortgage products that limit the number of homeowners who can use them or raise the cost for the homeowners. With some key examples I can give you in, in recent guidelines, one is that mortgage loans are available for double wide homes, but not most single wide manufactured homes and for newer homes, but not older ones that this leaves out most of the manufactured home market made up of older single section homes that are still very desirable, an important part of the market and also need financing. Second, I wanted to highlight that manufactured home buyers need construction loans to buy and site the home. Buyers unable to use a single closing construction loan with low down payment guidelines that make it accessible are paying more to finance a home's purchase and construction before then uh, refinancing to get up a permanent purchase loan, essentially um, double the closing cost. Um, another to highlight for you is the credit limit example where credit limits currently eliminate many manufactured home buyers. While the enterprises can use something like a 620 minimum credit score, we lend uh, with an average 620 credit score meaning half of our manufactured home borrowers who we know are successful with their loans uh, would not be eligible for enterprise financing just on credit alone. The New Hampshire Community Loan Fund's 18 year record of successfully lending in this market has shown us that manufactured homeowners are good borrowers and manufactured homes are good collateral. Our welcome home loans are fixed rate, long-term low down payment mortgages for manufactured homes in rocks or on their own land in New Hampshire. Um, and that cover the full range of needs that people tell us that they need for purchase, refinance, home improvement, as well as construction loans um, to finance the install and setup of new manufactured homes. And we still see demand is high and delinquent rates are low with loan losses of only about 2.3%. Um, um, we would also like to point out the Fannie Mae, New Hampshire, Manufactured Housing Community Initiative as a unique initiative that could be expanded. It serves owners of manufactured homes in rocks using existing Fannie Mae loan products through the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. And with streamlining of this model, we think it could be used, used in other states as well. Um, and the last point I've, I would offer is uh, regarding financing of equity investors that disadvantages rock residents. So the opportunity for residents to purchase their manufactured home parks where their homes are located is an important element to uh, making the homes affordable and available long term. Um, competition for the communities is fierce. <laughs> it's well known that this asset class is a high return investment. And this competition for the community ownership and the GSC financing of the community owners not only drives up park prices, it challenges residents' ability to compete with the private equity money and low cost capital. In one recent transaction here in New Hampshire, the park owner had low interest rate Freddie Mac mortgages on three communities. And the purchase and sale agreement with their buyer, another large investor, provided for assumption of those Freddie Mac mortgages by the buyer. Now the cooperative created by the residents to purchase the communities did not qualify to assume those mortgages. And the disadvantage was further exacerbated by the cost of defeasance of those same loans that led to each transaction costs being increased by over a million dollars paid by the residents and directly affecting the affordability of their communities. So under the guise of duty to serve, those uh, GSCs are serving the investors in the manufactured home market, buyers that already have access to private equity capital to the detriment of the homeowners that the duty to serve is intended to benefit. To truly benefit low and moderate income residents, the GSCs low interest loans to acquire manufactured home communities should be available to residents acquiring their communities as limited equity cooperatives, or if not available um, for the residents 
as direct loans, the GSC should insist on resident protections, including long-term leases and um, rent controls that maintain affordability. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. Hopkins. Our next speaker is Ms. Rachel Siegel from the Pew Charitable Trust. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rachel Siegel and I'm a research officer at the Pew Charitable Trust. Pew is a global non-governmental research and public policy organization dedicated to serving the public. We strive to improve public policy by conducting rigorous analysis, linking diverse interests to per pursue common cause and focusing on tangible results. I work on the home financing team, which launched in July, 2020. This team specifically focuses on manufactured housing loans, the dearth of small mortgages relative to the availability of low cost homes, and the non-mortgage alternative arrangements that millions of Americans use to purchase homes of all types when more traditional loans are not accessible. Manufactured housing is one of the largest sources of unsubsidized affordable homes in the United States, and it's especially important for low and moderate income Americans. Previous to COVID-19, the US was in the grip of a housing crisis due to the lack of a housing supply and skyrocketing housing prices. With the 2020 pandemic resulting recession and boom in demand coupled with housing supply that is not kept up, makes the need for quality homes that can be built quickly and affordably even more immediate. While manufactured housing can help fill these gaps in our current stock, buyers face obstacles in obtaining safe and affordable financing. This undermines the potential of manufactured housing as a solution to the supply and affordability crisis faced across America. Today, I'm going to focus my comments on five key areas. Mortgage financing, retitling, chattel or personal property loans, ROCs and tenant lease site protections. Pew applauds the work that the enterprises have done to purchase mortgages for manufactured homes titled as real property. It is also noteworthy that Fannie Mae is expanding its pilot mortgage, mortgage loan program for manufactured homes lo located in resident owned communities and also exploring mortgages um, on leasehold land. This is important because these populations currently are only eligible for personal property loans, which have been shown to carry much higher interest rates and have fewer consumer protections. When it's possible to allow mortgage financing for manufactured homes, we encourage the enterprises to do so. There's another important opportunity to increase access to mortgages that neither Fannie Mae nor Freddie Mac has noted. That's a concerted effort to improve manufactured home titling as real property so that more buyers and owners are eligible for mortgage financing. Over three fourths of new manufactured housing is titled as personal property, yet more than half of buyers also own their land. More research to understand the underlying reasons why buyers do not retitle their manufactured homes as real property when they're eligible to do so is critical. And this is especially true if only real property mortgage loans will be purchased by the enterprises. This research is of interest to Pew and we welcome partnership as we consider contributing factors and potential solutions. It's also important to note that right now, both of the enterprises have eliminated plans to launch personal property loan pilots. With such a large proportion of buyers and owners titling their homes as personal property, this results in the inability to make the kind of significant difference that was intended by duty to serve. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau recently published research which found that Black, African-American, Hispanic, and Indigenous families are more likely to use personal property financing than their non-Hispanic white counterparts. This was true even holding land ownership constant, and personal property loan borrowers had very similar financial profiles to those who use mortgages for their manufactured home purchases. Unfortunately, failure to serve personal property loan borrowers is likely to disproportionately exclude minority borrowers who tend to use such loans. So now I wanna to turn to homes and communities. Freddie Mac's research of resident owned communities shows that residents are better able to control costs make decisions that affect their homes and greatly reduce the threat of that their land will be redeveloped compared to manufactured home residents elsewhere. Investors currently have far superior access to credit backed by the enterprises compared to residents. Giving similar access to communities seeking to buy their land is critical to improve 
homeowners' ability to maintain financial and housing stability and security. Pew, appla Pew applauds both enterprises for their focus on increasing the liquidity and purchase of loans of resident-owned communities and urges both to work diligently to expand such purchases. Lastly, I wanna commend both enterprises for their success at expanding tenant site lease protections. These are extremely important for those who rent their land. However, I'd be remiss to ignore the fact that there is an entrenched imbalance of power between owners and residents in these communities. Investment in manufactured home communities has been referred to as the darling of private equity by Forbes in 2020 and has been touted as one of the best returns on investment. Investors benefit from access to multifamily loans backed by a secondary market. And they also receive discounts for offering tenant site lease protections. While we commend Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for their success at introducing such protections, we also urge them to expand these requirements to as many communities and residents as possible in order to help homeowners remain more stably housed. Pew is engaged in research relevant to these discussions, such as researching the determinants of manufactured home loan denials, as well as the use of cash or non-mortgage arrangements such as rent to own or land contracts to purchase a home in the absence of safe and affordable mortgages. We would welcome the opportunity to exchange insights with um, FHFA, the enterprises and industry stakeholders. Thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to engaging with FHFA, the enterprises and stakeholders as we work to improve access to safe and affordable manufactured housing loans. Thank you, Ms. Siegel. Our next speaker is Mr. Bill Packer from America Financial Resource. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you, Toy. I appreciate it. First, I'd like to start by thanking FHFA for hosting these listening sessions. As uh, I've participated over the last several years in these, I, I, I find them helpful not only to have direct input, but also to hear many of the other speakers, their comments and, uh, and recommendations. I'd also like to thank uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae for their partnership uh, over the last several years as we've progressed our capabilities and our offerings in the marketplace for manufactured home as well uh, as other lending products. For those who don't know, American Financial Resources is a 25-year-old mid-sized residential uh, lender, and we have more than a decade of experience in both chattel lending and uh, manufactured home real property lending. Um, Approximately 50% of our volume is manufactured home lending. And in the last 12 months, uh, we are proud to say that we made loans to over 4,500 families in the manufactured home space. Uh, regretfully, only 916 of these or approximately 25% or rather 20% were delivered to uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Uh, the rest primarily went to uh, FHA um, uh, and wound up in a Ginnie Mae security. Over the last uh, three days, as I've listened to all of the duty to serves um, uh, speakers, it's, it's clear to me that the duty to serve has uh, the capability to help the low to moderate income individuals, um, serves a diverse clientele, including both rural, suburban, and urban population, and that there are well-documented home ownership challenges, although we haven't talked about it today. In previous days, we've, we've heard well-documented home ownership challenges, particularly uh, for communities that, that are predominantly uh, populated by people of color uh, and, uh, and other uh, less or underserved communities. We haven't talk, talked about it today, but in previous days, um, we've heard about the challenges that climate change is posing to uh, many of these communities. And I think uh, a previous speaker mentioned uh, how that can impact uh, the manufactured home space, and it's particularly acute for older manufactured homes. With all that said, um, I think manufactured home lending is well positioned to address needs across a wide uh, spectrum. Um, 
in the manufactured home space, because of the manufactured home process, we uh, see a high quality product for the dollar spent. And the manufactured home itself can address um, shortages of homes that traditional stick builders, because of the economics, simply don't make sense uh, to, to be in those communities. Um, it also can serve the unique needs of those over age 62, um, uh, folks who would like to age in place but need uh, a, a, a home that is on a single level uh, because they, they're worried about having to climb stairs or that need a smaller home or that are on a fixed income and need the benefits of the manufactured home at, it, at its more affordable price point. Certainly the first time home buyer market with the manufactured home being more af affordable um, can assist communities in, in having home financing um, uh, that that makes sense for them and for those first time home buyers. I think um, I'll turn now uh, to uh, 10 suggestions. What do we need in the lending community? Um, as Dr. Sullivan mentioned in her remarks, titling is an issue. So we need better education. Manufactured home dealers in our experience tend to gravitate towards products uh, financing products that are quick to close, which often um, steers borrowers towards uh, chattel product, which tend to have a higher interest rate than the real property. And so it's to some extent a disservice um, to, those, to those communities. So I would urge education both for manufactured home dealers, as well as for the general public on why titling to real property can be uh, beneficial for them. Um, as Mr. Kopstein remarked, the fact that there is a negative LLPA for manufactured home is a disincentive for um, uh, lenders to make uh, manufactured home loans. These are loans that are already tend to be smaller size, and now we have a negative LLPA, a loan level pricing adjustment from Fannie and Freddie. Um, that further disincentivize us. So I'd urge us to look at those LLPAs and perhaps um, think about um, uh, resolving those. We need to see more appraisal waivers. We certainly have the data. Um, and so uh, we could, I believe, see more appraisal waivers, which would have the added benefit of making an already uh, challenged first time home buyer or uh, individual who is having trouble with the down payment, um, make these even more affordable. We need more flexibility with appraisals. Um, if we're in a mixed community where there is um, both stick built and a similar uh, manufactured home product, we need to empower the appraiser to use a similar stick built product as part of their comparison, if in their view, it is uh, comparable. Again, as Dr. Remaining. I'm sorry? One minute remaining, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Yes, no, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, as Dr. Sullivan uh, mentioned, we need less restriction on, on single wide. Um, we also need more flexibility on single loan waivers. Um, because when we make a mistake, as sometimes happens in the manufacturing home process, um, we need Fannie and Freddie to work with us uh, to resolve those, those issues. Um, as Mr. Ryman remarked, the PSPA housing caps disproportionately impact some of these communities. And so I think um, those should be uh, looked at as well. And then finally, I'd under, underscore what Mr. Beck said, um, although AFR has yeah, a down payment, a, a down payment assistance program, um, we're only able to use it with FHA. We cannot currently use it with Fannie and Freddie, although we've asked for the program to be approved many times, and I would urge us to look at that as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time today. Thank you, Mr. Packer. Um, our next speaker is Ms. Leslie Gooch from Manufacturer Housing Institute. Thank you so much, Toy. 
I appreciate today's focus on the enterprise's duty to serve manufactured housing. It's great to hear from all the speakers today who are contributing to this discussion from a variety of perspectives, but that they're universally interested in the enterprises increasing their involvement and support for manufactured housing. MHI is the only national trade association that represents all segments of the factory built housing industry. MHI's members are responsible for close to 85% of the manufactured homes produced each year. In light of the impact of COVID-19, in terms of exacerbating the affordable housing shortage in the country, MHI believes the importance of the enterprises carrying out their statutory duty to serve manufactured housing responsibilities <laughs> is more important than ever, and that it should be a top priority. As you have heard from other speakers today, Involvement by the enterprises in chattel financing is more critical than ever to support consumers seeking home ownership through manufactured housing. Both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had established goals in, for their chattel, for chattel purchases in their prior plans. They spent considerable time and resources to learn about and gather information and research regarding the chattel market. However, as we all know, in the end, neither enterprise purchased chattel loans. MHI appreciates that FHFA may have raised questions about the enterprises resuming the purchase of chattel loans. However, the GSEs retreating from previous promises to purchase chattel loans under their statutory duty to serve manufactured housing goes entirely in the wrong direction, away from mortgage access to credit. At a time when the economy begins its recovery from the COVID crisis, and at a time when the affordable housing shortage in this country has only gotten worse. With the vast majority of manufactured homes being financed by chattel, MHI believes that Fannie and Freddie cannot be considered to meet their statutory duty to serve without both a substantive commitment to chattel loans and performance to match that commitment. With respect to purchases of real property manufactured home loans, both of the enterprise plans include targets to increase their purchase of real property home loans through their th new three-year plans. While we very much appreciate the progress that has been made here, we are concerned that the targets just are not high enough. We recommend that both enterprise prizes revise their targets upward, and we urge the FHFA to require them to do so. We are pleased that both Fannie and Freddie introduce new programs that provide conventional financing for manufactured homes that have site-built features. These homes have the potential to reach areas of the country where manufactured housing has in the past been zoned out by discriminatory land use regulations at the state and local level. We commend the enterprises for their leadership in this area, and we urge them to continue these efforts, particularly with appraisers. We urge the enterprises to provide further support on challenges the industry has seen across the board, specifically with respect to zoning, appraisals, and engagement issues. Finally, regarding the enterprise's support for the purchase of manufactured housing communities, I think it is important to point out the value to consumers that come from home ownership in for-profit manufactured housing communities. We understand that there are concerns with some bad actors who are raising rents excessively and otherwise acting in bad faith. But raising rents and evicting tenants is absolutely counter to the prevailing business model of every professional land lease community owner operator who relies upon stable rent and high occupancy. Recently, MHI completed a robust independent analysis of the professionally owned manufactured home community industry to move away from anecdotal cases and help the policymakers understand the real operating conditions, the investment and maintenance activities, and typical outcomes of residents in professionally managed for-profit land lease communities. An independent consulting firm was hired and completed a comprehensive research and analytical study across well over 700 respondent residents and over 1,000 professionally managed communities operation data. 
The independent research found the following. First, residents in professionally managed manufactured housing communities value their community management and they value the extensive offering of amenities and the ongoing investment in professionally managed manufactured housing communities. Professionally managed communities consistently improve and routinely make investments in their communities each year, enhancing near term and long term value of the community for its residents. And finally, lease rates are competitive. Rent increases are at par or lower than other housing alternatives in those markets. We urge the enterprises to continue their work to support for-profit land lease manufactured housing communities. That said, we have consistently argued that the duty to serve credit should be specifically targeted to supporting the financing for the consumer. We encourage FHFA to move the enterprises back to a consumer focus when it comes to their activities for duty to serve. Again, we appreciate the enterprise's support for land lease manufactured housing communities, and we do hope that that support will continue. However, within duty to serve, we strongly encourage a concerted focus on creating a secondary market for chattel financing so that residents in the land lease communities can also be supported. In closing, MHI appreciates the efforts by FHFA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac to comply with the duty to serve manufactured housing mandate. However, for duty to serve to truly succeed, the emphasis must be on performance, accountability, and transparency. Thank you for your consideration of my recommendations. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Ms. Gooch. Our next speaker is Mr. Scott Olson from Olson Adv Advocacy. Uh, thank you, Toy. Um, uh, uh, again, my name is uh, Scott Olson, and in uh, full disclosure, I do work for the Manufactured Housing Institute. But as some of you know, I was previously the Democratic Housing Policy Director and top Democratic Housing Staffer for 15 years for the House Financial Services Committee until I left about a decade ago. <clears throat> and it's in that capacity that I'm making these remarks. In fact, while working on the committee, I personally developed the concept of duty to serve and I drafted the language that finally became law in response to a directive from my boss, ranking member Barney Frank. <clears throat> he then worked closely on a bipartisan basis with housing subcommittee chairman Bob Nay who developed the critical rural component of duty to serve. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are government sponsored entities. In one form or another, they've had either the explicit or implicit backing of taxpayers. We expect something in return for that guarantee that the GSEs will not operate purely as profit maximizing entities, but will also fulfill their charter duty to create a secondary market to serve our housing needs. Since 1992, the GSEs have had housing goals. <clears throat> Despite the nonsense put out by some that the goals had a role in the 2008 housing crisis, goals simply create numerical requirements that the GSEs portion of low and moderate income loans does not lag the general market. Simply put, the GSEs can't use their government guarantee to skim off the better borrowers. Unfortunately, around 2005, uh, Congressman Frank understood that the goals could not be that the goals could be met without serving certain important segments of the housing market. And the precipitating development was that we were uh, of this was that we were seeing a reduction in the number of manufactured home loans being purchased by Fannie and Freddie. At the time, we also witnessed an unwill a general unwillingness by the GSEs to underwrite and purchase loans for federally assisted low income housing developments particularly for housing preservation. <clears throat> so we crafted a duty to serve requirement, which became law as part of HERA in 2008. I won't take up your time summarizing duty to serve, but put simply, the GSEs must serve the underserved markets of manufactured housing, affordable housing preservation, and rural housing. And as part of this duty, they have to purchase these loans, develop innovative loan products, and do outreach to lenders. I want to make uh, three critical points about duty to serve. First, 
this is not a requirement to purchase loans that the GSEs expect to lose money on. Instead, it builds on their charter, which already created an explicit requirement to purchase loans that serve the market, but have a lower rate of return. Second, this is not a general duty to serve, but a specific duty to serve three markets, manufactured housing, affordable housing preservation, and rural housing. Third, and probably most importantly, these three markets were singled out because of two key factors that helped explain why Fannie and Freddie were not fully serving them, even though they could probably lend in them. The first factor is that manufactured home, affordable housing preservation, and rural housing loans are lower volume loan areas. A profit maximizing entity wants to make cookie cutter loans with high volume, but none of these three areas have the broad impact of generic single family or multifamily loans. Second, they involve somewhat more work and understanding on the part of the GSEs. In the case of manufactured home loans, there are substantive difference between site build homes and manufactured homes. In the case of programs like project-based section eight, there are challenges such as the need for government rule of assistance and other low income project requirements. So prior to adoption of duty to serve in 2008, instead of the GSEs rolling up their sleeves to understand the section eight, section 236 and RHS multifamily loan programs so they could make a lot of these loans, Instead, we saw, unfortunately, GSEs making their housing goals by artificially parking large number of multifamily loans with an agreement to sell them back after they counted in the goals. Finally, let me go to the specific topic of today's listening session, manufactured housing. <clears throat> Again, acknowledging that I do work for MHI, my comments on this subject will reflect my personal thoughts arising out of manufactured housing being the impetus for a Congressman Frank creating duty to serve in the first place. First, regarding real estate backed loans, both Fannie and Freddie are proposing in their 2022 to 2024 plans to purchase fewer real estate backed manufactured home loans in 2022 than they did in 2020. Since, as I explained, a retrenchment in GSE purchase of real estate backed loans, manufactured loans, was the precipitating factor in creating the duty to serve, I would expect this proposed reduction to come under some scrutiny. More importantly, the benchmark for evaluation should not be the proposed numbers in their duty to service, serve plans, but their actual volume of purchases. Second, a big part of the recent discussion on manufactured housing has been about chattel loans. <clears throat> in spite of what some parties in Washington have erroneously claimed, the statute does not explicitly require Fannie and Freddie to purchase chattel loans. Instead, it says that regarding GSE compliance with duty to serve FHFA, quote, may consider loans secured by both real and personal property, unquote. So what does that mean to me as the staffer who actually developed the statutory language I just quoted here? To me, it says that Fannie and Freddie must make a good faith effort to determine whether they can purchase chattel loans in a financially responsible manner. And if they can find a way to do that, they should or must do so. It does not mean Fannie and Freddie can decide not to purchase chattel loans because chattel loans are more complicated than other single family loans. It does not mean Fannie and Freddie can decide not to purchase chattel loans because they have a lower potential of loan volume. And it does not mean Fannie and Freddie can decide not to purchase chattel loans simply because they might be slightly riskier than real estate backed loans, particularly since they can pursue offsetting financial strategies like LLPAs and risk sharing. One minute remaining. In closing, thank you. In closing and moving beyond manufactured housing duty to serve in general, I believe the debate over the proper role of duty to serve will only increase in importance as the GSEs potentially move out of conservatorship. When that happens, when and if that happens, pressures to maximize profits will only intensify. When that happens, pressures to focus on high volume cookie cutter loan business will only intensify. And that means that a strong and vigorous application and enforcement of duty to serve will be more important than ever. So thank you for this opportunity to make a presentation. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Okay, so our next speaker is a longtime advocate for manufactured housing um, with a longstanding career background working at HUD and Jenny May, Mr. Phil Schultz. Well, thank you, Toy, and good afternoon to everyone who's on this call. 
I appreciate the Federal Housing Finance Agency uh, conducting these two listening sessions, which I think are an important way to get public input. Uh, as I stated, I have a background from manufactured housing finance, construction, regulations, and also with secondary market operations. So it's given me a wide perspective on what the potential is for manufactured housing to be a housing solution for the American people. Um, I submitted a number of written comments to do, cover some of the questions in the duty of the RFI concerning the duty to serve plans. And given that we've heard so much today, I'm going to keep my comments very brief. Uh, there are four main areas that I would like to talk about. One is the duty to serve plans concerning the rural housing market. The second is a subject that doesn't get enough attention, which is safety and soundness in program administration and planning. The third is equity, uh, inclusion, and diversity in terms of providing credit. And the last is just a few sentences about what could be a possible uh, path forward for the child loan program. So first, uh, I noticed in the duty to serve plans that Freddie Mac had proposed what he called a tailored solution for rural housing lending, which would allow some non-conforming loans and other exceptions from the typical requirements. It also made a commitment to continue to work with the uh, consumer development finance agencies and others to learn from the experience and also to continue to support it. That is exactly the kind of tailored loan approach that would be very effective for the manufactured housing chattel program or personal property lending. Uh, this, the second area would be the, the uh, subject of safety and soundness. Both of the enterprises have indicated that there were concerns by the FHFA about the safety and soundness of personal property lending. I didn't see exactly what they were, but I thought that I might give some additional input. And that input is detailed in my comments that are posted on the website about those things. There's basically four areas covered. One is of course the default risk. The second is the severity and losses from repossessions. The third is pricing proper pricing for the guarantee or risk. And the fourth is just setting up a really strong, well-founded and properly administered loan purchase program. First, concerning the subject of the uh, safety and soundness uh, default risk. One of the, the challenges in lending has always been for me is deciding of the many things that are propose for origination and underwriting standards, which are the ones that are the most important in terms of defining default risk. Based on the research done by the Federal Housing Finance Agency, we are beginning to get some answers for those things, and those are detailed in my public comments. The second area is I provided some information about the frequency and losses from repossessions based upon security filings, which also should be an important part of the agency's thinking about chattel loans. The third is having to do with guarantee pricing and also setting up a sound program. I think I have very great confidence that the enterprises can develop proper loan price, proper guarantee pricing, and also a strong lender program with proper lender standards and proper loan and origination and servicing standards. That's essential for this being an effective program. The next area I'd like to talk very briefly about is equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'd just like to quote briefly from the Consumer Finance Protection Agency, which in effect had a, a very uh, interesting quote about the chattel loan program versus the rest of the single family industry. And they said that compared to mortgages, chattel loans have higher interest rates, shorter loan terms, lower loan amounts, fewer consumer protections, and are really refinanced. I don't think anyone could be satisfied with that as the housing choice for unfortunately way too many American people. So I hope that in looking at this issue and the affordability housing crisis in America, that the agencies will take another look at 
the importance of having personal property financing to promote equity. It also promotes additional choices for people of color and other uh, communities that have not had access to as much financing. Uh, the last area I'd like to cover very briefly would be what a program for purchases could look like. In the duty to serve plans, the agencies so the enterprises have proposed to make $3 billion worth of mortgage purchases in high needs rural areas. This, uh, a, this is a very substantial effort and I commend them for taking that level of effort. In these same high needs rural areas, manufactured housing is 15 to 20% of the housing supply and needs support along with other mortgage lending. A, a, a duty to serve personal property lending program that is even a fraction of that would have a major impact in providing additional housing choice for the American people. And I think it can be done in a way that is both safe and sound and will eventually make manufactured housing take its place as one of the premier affordable housing solutions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Okay, and so our next speaker <clears throat> has provided a written statement um, and we will um, have that read out to you, um, doing the honors and reading um, out the written statement. Um, for our next speaker um, is our managing director of Duty to Serve, Ms. Marcia Berenger, um, speaking, um, reading out the written statement of Tony Kovac. Hello, everybody. As Toy said, due to technology issues that the next presenter had at a previous FHFA listening session, FHFA will read the following statement from Tony Kovach of MHA, sorry, of mhpronews.com. <clears throat> Please note that the following statement reflects the views of the author, and my reading does not represent any endorsement of these views by FHA. FHFA. Just bear with me for a moment while I open this. Connecting the dots. It's widely believed that America is in an affordable housing crisis. An impressive array of decades of third party research documented how HUD code manufactured homes are misdefined. Manufactured homes are the most proven form of affordable housing in the US. Rival factory building modular home builders association director Tom Hardiman said, I will never make a disparaging remark about a manufactured home. It is a viable and affordable housing solution that is much needed in this country. Hardiman said the Clayton backed MHI branded cross mod homes are deceptive. He argued that cross mod undermines the value of millions of existing manufactured homes. During the March 2021 duty to serve listening session, most presenters like myself presumably did not know in March that the GSEs would later announce that they would not be offering any support for home only or chattel lending for manufactured homes. That blatant withdrawal of support for manufactured housing's most used lending chattel loans flies in the face of the key purpose of the duty to serve manufactured housing. So who says Kevin Clayton in comments to Congress on behalf of Clayton Homes and MHI Kevin said the lack of liquidity and credit in the manufactured housing sector has limited financing options for our home buyers. Kevin blamed zoning and placement issues failure to properly implement the enhanced preemption of manufactured homes under the Manufactured Housing Improvement Act of 2000 and the failure for failure to implement the congressionally mandated duty to serve manufactured homes among the fa factors for the decline in home sales and activities within the manufactured housing market coincides with a number of challenges. MH Pro News' analysis on Kevin's comments noted similarities to much that March Weiss, Mark Weiss, JD, CEO of MHARR has said on those topics. 
That does not mean that Kevin and Mark Weiss see the DTS process precisely the same. Weiss said on March 21st, 2021, that the DTS process has been exposed as a shell game. Sadly, Fannie and Freddie are seemingly demonstrating Weiss's claim. Note to users, FHFA says they will post these written comments, which hotlink the evidence for these statements and allegations on their website. Each quote and reference are linked to the evidence. Kevin Clayton told Congress, MHI and its members have long demonstrated to rating agencies, investors, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA, Ginnie Mae, and others that manufactured housing lenders operate within a disciplined lending environment. Despite this performance, the GSEs have had little involvement and displayed little interest in financing, <clears throat> excuse me, and securitizing manufactured home loans. Less than 1% of GSE business comes from manufactured housing, and none of that comes from manufactured housing personal property loans. Clayton's statement on securitizing merits a brief explanation to oversimplify <clears throat> when a lender makes or originates a home loan, they either keep that loan on their own books or they sell the loan off to the secondary investor market. In his comments to FHFA, former HUD and FHA loan program official Phil Schulte carefully documented pages of reasons why the GSEs could safely and sustainably securitize chattel lending under DTS. Doug Ryan with Prosperity Now accused MHI and Clayton Holmes of thwarting the implementation of duty to serve <clears throat> personal property lending on manufactured homes, said Ryan. This capital access advantage held by Clayton Homes and their affiliated lending is likely why it and MHI have been unwilling to effectively criticize the exclusion of chattel loans from the DTS rule, even though such loans could bolster manufactured home sales by attracting new lenders. Ryan said it was time to end the monopoly Clayton Homes had over the manufactured housing market through finance. Bud Lebton et al. in their book, Pro Berkshire Book Motes, The Competitive Advantage of Buffett and Munger Businesses, said this about Clayton Homes and their affiliated lending. Buffett said, we are in no hurry to record income, have enormous balance sheet strength, and believe that we are over the long term. The economics of holding our consumer paper are superior to what we can now realize through securitization. So Clayton has begun to retain loans. Lebaton's Moat's book was published in 2012. Lebaton describes events circa 2003. Buffett's, Buffett's Clayton has begun to retain its loan strategy was precisely, precisely what occurred as Buffett Berkshire's book and Clayton have said on November 5th, 2020, MH Pro News reported a tip from an MHI insider. That insider said that Tim Williams, CEO of Berkshire owned Clayton Holmes' sister brand, 21st Mortgage Company, had said this with MHI members present. Williams said he was happy that the GSC's duty to serve pilot program for manufactured home chattel loans pilot program failed. MH Pro News reported that some six months before Freddie and one minute remaining, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac made their respective announcements that proved Williams' word and that tip to be correct. This begs the question, how could Williams and 21st have known that the GSEs were going to do six months in advance? Is it an obvious there was illicit, if not illegal market rigging collusion between Williams, 21st, Fannie and Freddie? Abraham Lincoln famously observes that no man has a good enough memory to be a successful liar. More specifically, Honest Abe might have said that no one can successfully sustain a serious deception for years when they routinely publicly comment to various parties, disconnects are found in the details, sliers, deceivers, and con artists may sooner or later contradict themselves. Different than his posturing for Congress, Kevin Clayton said in a video interview with a transcript on MH Living News to pro Berkshire interviewer Robert Miles that Warren Buffett is very competitive. He paints an image in each of our managers' minds about this moat, this competitive moat, and our job is simply simple and we share it, deepen and widen your moat to keep the competition out. Some of our competitors do a good job, but our plans are to make that more difficult for them. Warren Buffett has spoken about his purportedly monopolistic moat method. Buffett bragged that there is a class warfare and that his class, the billionaire class, are winning. Such a durable competitive advantage of holding Clayton's loans on Berkshire's books would only work if Clayton and Berkshire could keep the limit or thwart the DTS chattel 
loan program and the FHA Title I Home Only Loan Program. Either magically or by dark design, FHA Title I has been severely limited via the notorious 1010 rule 13 years after DTS was enacted. There is no personal property lending on manufactured homes. Meanwhile, there is DTS lending on land lease communities or what Hardiman calls the deceptive and far more costly and market failed cross mod project. Congress established financing for affordable housing. This was turned on its head and by financing products and communities for so-called predatory firms that are often MHI members. Manufactured home residents say the status quo creates less affordable housing. Democratic law lawmakers, including current House Financial Services Committee Chair Maxine Waters, citing the Seattle Times, made a similar comment to Ryan's Democrats asked the CFPB and Justice to investigate because Clayton's lending placed minorities and others at a monopolistic disadvantage. Buffett responded by saying he made no apologies for Clayton Wolf's lending. So consumers today of the industry's most affordable manufactured homes are excluded from chattel home only lending under DTS. Given Clayton's chokehold on lending, is it surprising that the CFPB reported that some two thirds of all such manufactured home loans are by Berkshire or own 21st or Vanderbilt? Joe Biden said in a White House, executive order signing ceremony that capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, it's exploitation. This evidence-based combination of facts is either the world's biggest coincidence or a dark conspiracy hiding in plain sight to illegally manipulate the manufactured housing market. The Hobbs Act should be explored because there is fear sparked in our industry by some that they will be targeted if they speak out. Let's recap. Samuel Stroman at Knudsen Law said in his well footnoted research that he sees evidence of felony antitrust violations that appear to violate RICO laws. Stroman's research was reportedly reviewed by attorney Thomas Horton. Horton is a law professor that specializes in antitrust law and consumer protection. As my March 25th comments documented, Tim Williams at 21st issued a letter cutting off financing to thousands of manufactured home real retailers. Strawman and others have said it's prima facie antitrust violation. Clevin Clayton said that some 700, sorry, 7,500 manufactured home retailers vanished in the wake of the manufactured home downturn. That downturn paralleled the Buffett moat and notorious letter by Williams at 21st. Clayton said that over 200,000 jobs were lost and over 160 manufactured home plants closed. Clayton, 21st MHI associated attorneys and Berkshire Hathaway were given a documented opportunity to disprove or deny allegations made by Stroman and others. They declined to comment. MHI has repeatedly ducked these issues so the allocations stand publicly unchallenged. The Biden 2020 campaign website promised transparency for federal agencies. Let's get authentic transparency by examining these badges of fraud. The FHFA Inspector General should initiate an investigation into evidence-based allegations. They have harmed millions, including minority seniors, those on lower and fixed incomes. MHARR has repeatedly called on Congress to investigate the parent corruption and the DTS process, the GAO, and the DOJ should be investigating too. Thousands of manufactured home independents have been harmed by apparently corrupt, conflicted, rigged, and seemingly illegal processes. Congress, state level lawmakers, and others that can access subpoena powers and take testimony under oath should probe these concerns in a transparent manner. Whatever motivated investigators to discover that appears illegal should be appropriately prosecuted. A postscript with additional links, illustrations, and more information are part of this document that will link to the facts, evidence-based allegations, and related reports. Thank you. And that concludes the reading of Mr. Kovach's statement. Um, I'll just take a breath <laughs> uh, <laughs> and say before the enterprises uh, respond that uh, I really wanna take a minute to uh, thank all of our presenters today for sharing their comments and uh, for the audience for attending today's very long but very thought provoking uh, session. Uh, FHFA appreciates the diversity of views expressed uh, on the manufactured housing market today and uh, the knowledge uh, that all the speakers have of this market. 
uh, we will take all of the remarks that we heard today, as well as the comments posted on FHFA.gov in response to our request for information about the underserved market plans into account as we continue to work with the enterprises on their 2022 to 2024 underserved market plans for duty to serve. Uh, one change I just wanted to note that uh, at least one commenter brought up that we've already made recently is to approve a, a recent policy change to uh, allow individual written notice um, to residents of manufactured housing communities uh, that add tenant pad lease protections through a rules and regs change as opposed to uh, adding it to the lease. So we look forward to continued collaboration with all of you and uh, thank you for your participation once again. Toy. Thank you, Marcia. So we will now begin to hear closing remarks from the enterprises. Um, first up, we will hear from Freddie Mac. And speak in front of Freddie Mac, do you deserve Thanks. the name is Mr. Mike Dawson, Corey Aver, and Den Dennis Smith. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tori, and sorry for the delay in getting my, my video going. Um, you know, thank you so much to everybody for, for all of your comments today. And very helpful to us as we look to uh, finalize our plan this year and, and keep working on things, not just this year, but in the years to come. Yeah, I really appreciated all the focus on uh, needs of tenants and tenant protections as well. You see, this is very much in line with our priorities and we've actually, we've organized our core MHC business around this. Um, so that, you know, around tenant protections and, and rocks so that, you know, now we're seeing uh, the majority of the loans that we're quoting are loans that are committing to put uh, these protections in place. So very important to uh, increasing the adoption of the protections. And you know, as Marcia mentioned, um, already working on ways to make this easier to adopt and, and reach more communities. So again, we're going to take all of your comments into account as we look to finalize the plans. And Dennis, I know you have a, a, a thought or two to share as well. Thank you, Corey. And again, I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, those who spoke and those who either submitted responses online or plan on submitting uh, responses on and comments online. This feedback is really critical as we look to refine our 2022 to 2024 underserved market plans. We've made progress and know that there's much more to accomplish in this space. And Freddie Mac recognizes the important role that manufactured housing fills in safe, energy efficient, and affordable housing. We look forward to working with you to move the manufactured home market forward. So thank you again for your comments. Toy. Thank you, Mr. Smith. All right, so now we will hear from the Fannie Mae Duty to Serve team um, with uh, Mr. Mike Hernandez. Thank you, Toy, I really appreciate it. And th thanks to you and Marcia for running such a great program the last three days. I know it's a lot of work to organize and facilitate. And I know all of us at Fannie and I'm sure Freddie Mac as well, as well as everybody that was on the phone really uh, valued having these sessions and hearing the speakers. Um, to all of you that provided us uh, feedback, it was uh, well received. I got pages and pages of notes and uh, especially items that are actionable. Uh, that was what primarily we were listening for and how we can begin to adjust the plans to really make uh, even more impact. You gave us a lot to consider and we really, really sincerely appreciate that. Uh, it's always good to get challenged to do more. That's how we learn, that's how we grow. But I also wanna assure you that everyone, everyone at Fannie Mae from our CEO to our summer interns come to work every day focused on how we can support wealth creation for families, how we improve the lives of homeowners and renters and how we ensure equity across all our initiatives. Duty to serve is just one critical component of all the efforts that we have underway to serve our critical mission of housing for this country. Our leadership is becoming, our leadership in becoming a world-class ESG company, our green financing leadership, our leadership in disaster response, and our leadership now in racial equity efforts are just some examples of how we're stretching further to meet the moment 
and helping to change the housing industry for the better. Most of that work is not captured in duty to serve, but it's critical to the support of all our activities in duty to serve. And it's critical to what we are and what we do every day. So I wanted to be sure that you had that context. We welcome your specific feedback. And especially as you submit your comments in writing, let us know what we can do in the near term, how we can pivot to have the most impact. All of that will help us work with FHFA to prioritize those recommendations and to be able to take action. So again, thank you so much for your thoughtful comments, for your information and your feedback. I'm gonna turn it over to Jose Varial and Ben Navarro, two of our duty to serve team members who will give you a little bit more of what we heard in today's um, uh, comments. So thank you again. Thank, thank you, Mike. Hi, my name is Jose Villarreal and I lead Fannie Mae's uh, multifamily due to disturb initiatives for manufactured housing. So I just wanna thank you all for your comments and your feedback on these very important issues that impact manufactured housing. Many of you have played vital roles in advancing our duty to serve mission and impact during the first cycle. Many of you have partnered with us, collaborated with us on development of products and enhancements for not only tenant site lease protection, but also for non-traditional manufactured housing communities. Uh, many of you have become early adopters of these new products, and we thank you for leading the market by example. <clears throat> We're pleased with our progress that we've made so far in the first cycle, but we know that there's more work to do. For tenant site lease protections, we believe in creating greater awareness, greater ease of implementation and compliance, and overall standardization of the protections. The product is gaining momentum across the industry as more community owners realize the importance of having these protections in place for the residents. Since the launch of the program in 2019, we've acquired 16,000 units with tenant site lease protections across 130 properties, providing protections to residents that are not included in their standard site lease or required by state or local law. In 2020, based on lessons learned and market feedback, we released enhancements that ease some of the operational burdens of implementation and compliance of the protections, which resulted in a greater uptake of the program. We went from 23 properties in 2019 to 107 in 2020. Fannie Mae will be releasing new enhancements in this quarter, as Marcia had mentioned, and uh, we hope that that will also increase the uptake of, a program, of this program. Uh, we want to thank FHFA and Marcia for their acceptance of our proposal for these changes. We also remain extremely focused on developing solutions to increase liquidity to non-traditionally owned MHCs, such as nonprofits, governments, and, and resident-owned communities, as, e as these entities serve to prever uh, preserve the affordability and the security of living in manufactured housing communities. We've launched product enhancements that reduce the cost of capital to non-traditional manufactured community owners and also resident-owned communities. We've heard on the call and understand the, tar the need for targeted equity investments and, and we'll work with FH FHFA to explore this potential solution and other solutions mentioned on this call. And we thank you for your insightful and impactful comments and we look forward to your continu continued partnership through our second cycle of Duty to Serve. And I'll pass it to Ben. Thanks, Jose, and thanks everybody uh, who shared your feedback with us today. From the single family perspective, we've been pleased to hear validation on some of our efforts outlined in our 2022 to 2024 plan. We're pursuing MH titled as real estate in both fee simple subdivisions and in leasehold settings because we're aware of early but promising efforts to expand the reach of MH in these types of locations. We also agree that lower cost MH is critical to serve LMI borrowers. So we believe our late 2020 policy change allowing some single width manufactured homes is a valuable contribution to the market. We also acknowledge the limitations on older single width homes and are working on making it more available to more borrowers who need such financing. We also heard loud and clear that a great deal of our work, including some research and analysis is not accessible enough, which limits its potential impact. We'll take that to heart in the future, but I'll note that we're getting ready to publish some research on the geographic distribution of our loans to the public. And our 2021 plan also calls for us to publish summaries of much of our work, including efforts related to product development and to industry outreach. Regarding loan purchase, I'd like to share some context on how we arrived at those numbers. We set a three-year baseline based on the average of 2018 to 2020 purchase money mortgage loan purchases and we plan to pursue steady growth over and above that baseline as the next plan cycle progresses. Mr. Ryan noted that he understands but does not agree with our decision to consider only purchase money mortgages in our loan purchase goals. 
This is a truly valuable piece of feedback and something we would like to discuss further. But I will note that Fannie Mae will continue to finance manufactured housing refinances as they have been and will continue to be a significant portion of our total business. Our motivation to focus on purchase money mortgages is largely driven by the inherent unpredictability of refinances and the challenges of setting goals three and a half years in the future. Regarding MH title as personal property or chattel, we've got a lot to process and we look forward to reading your comment letters. Thanks again for contributing your time and your expertise today and so often throughout the past several years as well. We look forward to continued collaboration. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Navarro, um, Freddie Mac, and um, Fannie Mae Duty to Serve teams. Uh, this now brings us to the end of our of today's session on manufactured housing and concludes our series on the Duty to Serve public listening sessions on the enterprise's 2022-2024 underserved market plans. Thank you all again for joining us um, for these sessions. We really appreciate and value your feedback. The public comment period closes on July 17th. Um, so there's still time to submit your comments. Um, July 17th does fall on a Saturday and I just want to um, note that that does conclude on Saturday. It does not extend to Monday. Um, and so uh, to, mit, to submit your written comments, we would encourage you to visit our Duty to Serve website at www.fhfa.gov forward slash DTS. That concludes our session. Thank you.